Today is Sunday, April 4th. The year is 2021. This is No Easy Answers, and I am your host, Jules Taylor. Today, like all days, I have no easy answers for you. Well, thank you for tuning in from wherever you happen to be listening. My name is Jules Taylor. This is No Easy Answers, and I am delighted to have you with us for today's episode. No Easy Answers is a podcast about politics, philosophy, and the human condition, and we are entirely listener-supported, meaning that we entrust our listenership and people just like you to keep this show going. So if you like what we do and you want to help us grow, the single best way you can do that is by subscribing to our Patreon page. That's at patreon.com forward slash no easy answers. And thank you to all of our Patreon subscribers. You really do keep this show going and we quite literally could not do it without you. Short of a monetary donation, you can leave us a positive review in Apple Podcasts that helps us expand our reach. We also have several other ways you can engage with the show. We have links to our Reddit, Discord, Patreon, Facebook, Twitter, and the show notes. There's even a link in there where you can send us a voice message. And as always, you can send your comments, concerns, criticisms, or vitriol to noeasyanswerspodcast at gmail.com. And just as a side note, you can now listen to this show on Audible and Stitcher. Those are just two of the platforms we have added recently. All right, so before we get started, I want to send a huge thank you to our guest, Roderick Day. Roderick is a software developer and researcher living in Canada, and his website is redsales.org, where he has selective political writings available in multiple languages. Roderick will be joining us for the interview portion of the show in just a bit. Now, this episode is meant as a part two of our previous episode entitled Weeders in Xinjiang and Anti-Asian Hate with Dr. Asatar Bear. And if you haven't already listened of that episode, that's okay, but I would highly recommend you going back to listen to episode 26, but you don't have to listen to these episodes in order. So if you listen to this episode first and you haven't heard the other one yet, that's okay, and you can take these two episodes in independently. The previous episode focused on the six problems with the Weider genocide narrative as pointed out by Dr. Bear, and we also spoke about the long history of Western countries wishing to subjugate China and some misconceptions about China's population policies. It really was a great conversation about all of that, um, which is why I'm so excited to bring you my follow-up conversation with Roderick Day. And, you know, we'll get to our monologue and our interview shortly, but at this point, I just want to say that this show is not an academic show. And what I mean by that is that there are some podcasts out there that format their shows like a reading group, and I really love those types of shows, and I take in those types of shows regularly. But this show is not that kind of show, and I'm not trying to assign anyone some homework as the cost of admission of getting something out of an episode. So that being said, my conversation with Roderick is based on an article that he wrote It's a remarkable article titled The Xinjiang Atrocity Propaganda Blitz. And I want to encourage anyone listening to this episode to go into the show notes, find the link to that article, and read it. And I want you to, in an ideal world, right, you'd read the whole thing. But, you know, even if you just read a few paragraphs, what I really want you to do is follow the footnotes to some of the things that Roderick is citing. I'm asking you to do this for a couple reasons. One is that I want you to see how all of this information is right there in front of you. So you can see our conversation is based upon lots of publicly available information from reputable sources or interviews with the people in question. And the things we are discussing are not conjectures or conspiracies. All of this is a matter of historical record. And the second reason is because I want you to see what some of this media deception looks like with your own eyes. Uh, Because again, it's right there in front of you. A large part of our conversation has to do with what Roderick calls the propaganda blitz surrounding the Uyghur situation in Xinjiang. The Western propaganda machine is alive and well, and there are some blatant examples of media trickery he's discovered, and I think listeners would be astounded to see some of these things. So if you can find the time to read Roderick's article and follow a couple of the footnotes, I think you'll find he's done a really great job of laying all of this out plainly and concisely. And again, I will leave links to all of this in the show notes. 
And one more thing before we go, you know, I want to say that since our conversation, I have gone back and read this article a few more times, and there are some quotes that Roger points out, stuff that Winston Churchill said, uh, stuff said by Zbigniew Brzezinski and George Kennan. You know, all of these are really important characters in the shaping of Western foreign policy. But I thought it would be helpful to listeners to really unpack the implications of those quotes and how they comport with history. So basically, the monologue and the information and the quotes and the discussion with Roderick, all this came out of his article, all that was inspired by his article. And again, I'd really encourage you after you listen to the show, go back and listen to the other show if you haven't listened to that, right? But also go check the show notes for this show. Check out Roderick's article, follow the footnotes. And if you have any questions on all of this, hit us up on Twitter or, you know, any one of the handful of ways you can engage with the show. All right, so let's get to our monologue and our guest interview with Roderick Day. Afghanistan is a landlocked country that sits in a harsh and inhospitable area between the traditional crossroads of great powers. Forces from India, the Far East, the Middle East, and the West have all attempted to pass and have fallen before Afghanistan, the graveyard of empires. Alexander the Great invaded what is known today as Afghanistan in 330 BC as part of a war against Persia. It is said that Alexander lost as many men in one bloody day as he had in the four years it took him to conquer all the lands between the Mediterranean Sea and eastern Iran. The British fought Afghanistan in two wars during the 19th century, and once more in 1919, in attempts to control the country and block the expansion of Russia's sphere of influence towards India. Their incursions set a precedent for the Soviet and American invasions that followed, but they have all suffered a similar fate of defeat. In each case, after years and sometimes decades trying to control Afghanistan, the battle reached a stalemate in which foreign invaders were forced to withdraw, leaving behind a legacy of destruction and the loss of precious years in which Afghanistan could have developed and begun to thrive. Operation Cyclone was the name of the United States Central Intelligence Agency's program to arm and finance the Mujahideen in Afghanistan from 1979 to 1989, prior to and during the military intervention by the USSR. The Mujahideen were also supported by Britain's MI6, who conducted separate covert actions. This was one of the longest and most expensive covert CIA operations ever undertaken. Funding began with $695,000 in 1979, was increased dramatically to $20 to $30 million per year in 1980, and rose to $630 million per year in 1987. Operation Cyclone has been described as, quote, the biggest bequest to any third world insurgency. Afghanistan gained its independence in 1919 and was neutral during both World War II and the Cold War though both the United States and the Soviet Union tried to woo the Afghans by financing infrastructure and building projects within the country. The Soviet Union always considered the bordering nation of Afghanistan of interest to its national security. Since the 1950s, the USSR worked diligently to establish close relations with its neighbor by providing economic aid and military assistance. In the 1970s, matters took a dramatic turn in Afghanistan, and in 1978, members of the Afghan Communist Party overthrew a murdered President Mohammad Daoud Khan. Nur Mohammad Taraki, head of the Communist Party, took over and immediately declared one-party rule in Afghanistan. The government was extremely unpopular with many Afghans, and so the Soviets sought to bolster it with the December 1978 Treaty. In addition to increased economic assistance, the Soviet Union promised continued cooperation in the military field. Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev declared that the treaty marked a, quote, qualitatively new character of relations between the two nations. The treaty, however, did not help Afghanistan. Taraki was overthrown and killed by members of his own party who were dissatisfied with his rule in September of 1979. In December, on Christmas Day, Soviet troops moved into Afghanistan and established a regime more amenable to Russian desires. This began what many pundits referred to as, quote, Russia's Vietnam, as the Soviets poured endless amounts of money, weapons, and manpower into a seemingly endless civil war. Mikhail Gorbachev finally began the withdrawal of Russian troops nearly 10 years later. This unquestionably played a part in the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. 
The word mujahideen is the plural form of the word mujahid, which is the Arabic term for one engaged in jihad. Its widespread use in English began with reference to the guerrilla-type militant groups led by the Islamist Afghan fighters in the Soviet-Afghan war, and now extends to other jihadist groups in various countries. These disparate rebel groups and local warlords of Afghanistan came together and united against an atheist foreign invader. I'm going to quote Zbigniew Brzezinski from a 1998 interview. Brzezinski was counselor to President Lyndon B. Johnson, President Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, and he was the primary organizer of the Trilateral Commission. He is also responsible for what is now referred to as the Afghan Trap Doctrine. Quote, according to the official version of history, CIA aid to the Mujahideen began during 1980, that is to say, after the Soviet army invaded Afghanistan on December 24, 1979. But the reality, closely guarded until now, is completely otherwise. Indeed, it was July 3, 1979 that President Carter signed the first directive for secret aid to the opponents of the pro-Soviet regime in Kabul. And on that very day, I wrote a note to the president in which I explained to him that in my opinion, this aid was going to induce a Soviet military intervention. Brzezinski goes on to say, quote, We didn't push the Russians to intervene, but we knowingly increased the odds that they would. Then the interviewer asks, When the Soviets justified their intervention by asserting that they had intended to fight against secret U.S. involvement in Afghanistan, nobody believed them. However, there was an element of truth in this. You don't regret any of this today? Brzezinski responds by saying, Regret what? The secret operation was an excellent idea. It had the effect of drawing the Russians into the Afghan trap, and you want me to regret it? The day that the Soviets officially crossed the border, I wrote to President Carter essentially, quote, We now have the opportunity of giving to the USSR its Vietnam War. And indeed, for almost 10 years, Moscow had to carry on a war that was unsustainable for the regime, a conflict that brought about the demoralization, and finally the breakup of the Soviet Empire. Here is a clip of a 2017 interview with Sibig Brzezinski. During the president's trip through Asia, he went to Vietnam uh, and announced that we would now sell weapon systems to Vietnam. What, what's your sense of that announcement? I'm bothered by it because I think we're driving the Chinese into a box. We're now going to provide arms to their former allies, now enemies. It almost looks as if we're trying to uh, increase the threat to China. I'm not sure that that is a good policy. The Chinese can be quite emotional and they might ask themselves, well, what can we do to, to hurt the Americans? Who is here on the horizon? Who is a good candidate for sticking it to the Americans? Well, one little country comes to mind. In fact, it's a half a country. I think you know who I mean. And they happen to have certain kinds of weapons that others wouldn't like to see used. Uh, I think it's not the best way to manage a relationship, which is of course complicated. And the Chinese are used to being treated with respect, uh, even if they're not at the top of the pile. And I certainly don't see them being at the top of the pile for some years to come. But selling arms to the Vietnamese raises the question in my mind, what are we trying to tell the Chinese? that we are arming our new friends, who used to be their friends, in order to what? It's worth taking a look at a map and noting the proximity of Afghanistan to Xinjiang. In the words of Zbigniew, what are we trying to tell the Chinese? That we are arming our new friends who used to be their friends for what? If the Soviets in 1978 had reason to suspect the United States had secret involvement in Afghanistan, Imagine what the United States might have in place after having occupied the country of Afghanistan for the last 20 years. Well, maybe you don't have to imagine. Because the Wikipedia page for the National Endowment for Democracy says it's a U.S. agency that was founded in 1983 with the stated goal of promoting democracy abroad, and it is funded primarily by an annual allocation from the U.S. Congress. Since 2004, it has granted over $8 million to Uyghur groups including the World Uyghur Congress, the Uyghur Human Rights Project, the Campaign for Uyghurs, and the Uyghur Transitional Justice Database. It has also supported various groups of Chinese dissidents. In response, in 2020, China imposed sanctions on the National Endowment for Democracy's President Carl Gershman. 
The National Endowment for Democracy freely admits to funding these separatist groups. In a tweet on December 10th, 2020, they said, quote, To further hashtag human rights and human dignity for all people in China, the National Endowment for Democracy has funded Uyghur groups since 2004. The image they posted with the tweet is a Google Earth view of northwestern China, with China painted red, but the area of Xinjiang is blue with a white moon and a white star, just like the flag of East Turkestan, the country Uyghur separatists are calling for establishment. This is all to say, and I want to be clear when I say this, the United States has funded Muslim extremists, jihadists, and separatists since at least 1978. They are continuing to fund Muslim extremists, jihadists, separatists, and terrorists in the Xinjiang region of China. And they are not even trying to hide it, going as far as posting about it on Twitter. And before the CIA was funding jihadists in Afghanistan and separatists in Xinjiang, the CIA Tibetan program was covertly spreading anti-Chinese propaganda and conducting intelligence operations in the 1960s up until President Nixon visited China in 1972. It seems reasonable to assert the United States would attempt to lure China into a similar Afghan trap by way of funding Uyghur separatists in Xinjiang. Perhaps describing all of this as the new Cold War is most accurate in the sense that the CIA Tibetan program, Operation Cyclone, selling arms to China's neighbor Vietnam, the funding of Uyghur separatists, and casting accusations of genocide and human rights abuses at the People's Republic of China. All of this has been done by the United States to limit the spread of communism throughout Greater Asia and discredit China as to contain their influence across the continent. Maybe the question we should all be asking is, is the United States trying to give China its Vietnam War, both by arming the actual country of Vietnam and by funding separatists within the borders of China in Xinjiang? Joining me for our interview is Roderick Day, a researcher and software developer living in Canada. He's the author of an article titled The Xinjiang Atrocity Propaganda Blitz, available on his website, redsales.org. I highly recommend listeners find that link in the show notes and follow him on Twitter. So, Roderick, it's great to have you on the show. Welcome to No Easy Answers. I just started basically posting politics around November 2019 on Twitter. Um, I am just a software developer. I have no particular training on any political topic. And the reason I started is because I am Latin American and I've always been studying Bolivia very closely. And when the November 2019 coup happened, I found myself just really frustrated. Um, I, I didn't know what to do. Then I saw that some people were posting videos in Spanish coming out from Bolivia of, of uh, Evo Morales supporters explaining their position and they were getting absolutely zero play in English. And I figured, hey, I can just subtitle the stuff. And that's how I got started. I, got, I started subtitling videos, people started sharing them. I got introduced to some people, they were like, oh, you know, you have some good ideas, you should write it down. I, I kept arguing in various places, um, and eventually I started write, like actually taking it more seriously. Um, me and my friend Tom Fromm started uh, redsales.org, which is where we put most of our essays. And yeah. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for being here, man. I, I read your article, and I thought it was astounding for a number of reasons, you know. Um, in this article, I mean, you, you do such a thorough and concise job of laying out uh, basically like things with inconsistencies and in narratives in the media and the articles. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, there are things like, you know, you pointed out like right wing actors writing under pseudonyms um, and, and leftist <laughs> publications that are kind of increasingly using anti-capitalist rhetoric or jargon mm -hmm. that would maybe... Uh, trick the left into thinking this was a more leftist intended article. Um, so I just, you know, are you doing anything differently? Like, are you taking in media in any way that's different uh, than any other person with a Marxist or materialist lens would be taking? Yeah, in? I think that's a good question. Okay. So I studied engineering, studied mechanical engineering. And when I first started, 
I basically was like a left liberal. I've never been, I've always been kind of like, you know, I'm against racism and stuff like that, but I wasn't liberal. I was like just liberal. Sure. And I started engineering and I didn't actually, I was always kind of like, I'm going to finish studying engineering. And when I finish studying engineering, I will, I will actually learn all the politics stuff that I really kind of wanted to study. I always wanted to study politics and philosophy and things like that, but I decided to go for engineering. Mm-hmm. And so when I finished studying engineering, I, I started to kind of like try to make up lost ground. And like every, anyone who's making up lost ground, I was feeling, damn, there's a lot to catch up on, you know, like there's all the stuff I wanted to read. Like, and again, I, I wasn't, I didn't start by thinking I want to do Marxist stuff. I, I literally just wanted to read politics. There was a point at which I even started reading the right wingers because I was like, maybe the right wingers are right. You know, and I started reading mm-hmm. their stuff. Right. I didn't like it at all. Of course, um, <laughs> naturally things turned out. Um, and I eventually started reading uh left me media like i i don't do a lot of news like i've definitely come to these topics of i, I started learning about bolivia not because i was looking at the news but because as a i'm peruvian but i live in canada and as a peruvian person when i came to canada i wanted to bring the things that i liked about canada to peru this is kind of like this was like my original dream so to speak i was like damn canadians have universal health care and they have uh transit public transit like the metro And like, I really want that. So my research, my approach to politics was never premised on keeping up with the news, but more on, I want these nice things Canada has in Peru. And in doing this study, I became aware of like, like, you know, current events, like how, how do Canada do it? How are countries in Latin America doing it? So I came I came to these subjects via, I don't want to say theory first, but I came with a very definite objective. I was like, I want these things in Peru. And this structures my thinking, right? This means that I'm always looking for how do I achieve this concrete objective? In the case of Canada, I came to understand that Canadians didn't really achieve a lot of their objectives in a vacuum. as like a, a social movement inside Canada did stuff. But Canada actually benefited a lot from being right in between the United States and Soviet Union, right? Mm, there's a good right. paper to this effect. There's a paper out there. I can I can link it for the comments later. But there's it basically discusses how the threat of there's a very marked correlation between the threat that the, the USSR was presenting as like the threat of revolution and the concessions capitalist countries made, right? So I was like, oh so it's not just it's not just the Canadians achieved this. It's like they're, all these things are connected, right? Mm. So when we talk about news, the news cycle, yes, I think I fundamentally have a different approach than most people. I don't listen to the news. Uh, people often ask me, like, what, what news outlets should I subscribe? And I tell them, well, I like Telesur, I like CGTN, I like Causa Chun Coca News, uh, Causa Chun News, um, especially because I, I collaborated with... Uh, Oliver Vargas uh, in translating those videos. Oh, cool. Right? So, cool. yeah. So, but I, I also tell people, you know, don't, you don't really need to listen to the news. Like, there's no real reason you should be keeping up in this like hamster wheel kind of way when they introduce a new news article. It's like, look at this right now, and you're you're, you're starting to understand this new thing, and it's like, no, 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 look at this right now, and they keep kind of like, you know, the news cycle keeps keeps shifting your attention, and doesn't let you concentrate and go deep and really understand one topic. So yes, I would say that is fundamentally the way in which my approach is different than, than a lot of other people's. Not, not everyone's, but like a lot of other people's. Yeah, I, I, I want to touch on what you said about the um, the relationship between Canada and the USSR uh, as that um, you know pertains to capitalist concessions, perhaps in the form of like universal health care in Canada. Um, now, I, I'm sure we could get really in the weeds with like actual tangible things that happen to make those things happen Mm -hmm. right but purely on an abstract level it it seems that you're attaching in your in your media intake into a sort of geopolitical meta narrative like you're you're attaching to this overarching logic of the entire uh process of history uh so to say and so i i I think that's that's really great because i think that honestly maybe one of the the fundamental differences between the political outlooks of liberals and marxists is that i Mm -hmm. i think that marxists have a 
like a world view that they attach and subscribe to, you know, um, mm -hmm. and rooted mm -hmm. in history. Um, yes. And yes. That come yes, back yes, to yes, the yes. abstract concepts like the, like what you're mentioning between Canada and the USSR. So, um, so I know like some, I have a few socialist minded friends, obviously, you know, and they take in their media through like a narrative lens, meaning they, they can take in programming or articles and they examine them for their meta narratives and they, they kind of hold them in a, in a detached and external way. You know, so they feel like maybe they can like watch Rachel Maddow and gain something from her show and somehow not adopt her views on <laughs> Russia. Um, <laughs> and in the same way, they can maybe watch Tucker Carlson and not adopt any of his viewpoints. But, you know, there's a big difference there. Right. But um, MSNBC seems to function, at least within leftist circles, as like propaganda for people who do not think that they're uh, susceptible to pop propaganda, you know? Correct. Um so um, maybe you could, because we're we're talking about liberal media in a way, maybe you could speak to the way that liberal media outlets are increasingly using the language of anti-capitalism and uh, leftist outlets, like the small one you mentioned from uh, from China, Chuang, I, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, how they're yeah. like publishing right-wing actors under pseudonyms, um, because yeah. the, this, the Western propaganda machine is alive and real, and, and I think this level of trick trickery has like the potential to mislead even a principled Marxist. So uh, that's an interesting question. I don't want to. I don't want to cast doubts on like who's a principal Marxist or not. Right, like right. Yeah. what what constitutes a Marxist. But I'd say if you really have, like, if you really have your theory clear, I think there's a there's a less there's less of a chance that you'll actually be that easily misled. Um, and I think anyway, we can go into it a little bit later. As regards to the USSR Canada thing, I just want to uh, name drop or, or recommend something. Sure. There's a podcast based in Alberta called Alberta Advantage, and they have an episode called Corporate Welfare Bums, David Lewis and the CCF NDP featuring Robert Alexier. Um, so just to explain what the context was, I'm going to read the blurb from the episode, but like, did you know that the post-war CCF once wrote admiringly about the Red Army? That it's Canada's wartime economic planning as a great argument for the superiority of central planning and public investment? They authored pieces like Political Action for the 99% in 1943? Or the NDP leader, David Lewis, used to publicly name and shame Canadian corporations and avoided taxes while uh, soaking up publicly funded subsidies? So anyway, there's really good research out there. I recommend people look it out. Um, Tying it a little bit to what we talk about media diets, I don't have enough time. Like I, I, have, I, have, I have work, like I work, and uh, I really like doing a lot of this research, and I don't have enough time to kind of like leisurely spend it watching Tucker Carlson or, or Rachel Maddow, <laughs> right? Right? Right. right? Like I, part of the reason is like I, I curate a media diet that some people might call an echo chamber, but it's that from from my perspective, I exist in a very right wing society. Like I don't need to actually go out of my way. To hear Rachel Maddow, I will hear her. I will hear her opinions whether I want to or not. Just by being, just going out and about in Canada, you're gonna be, you're gonna, your, your coworkers are gonna casually bring up like the accusations that they hear on the news. So, as it pertains to a media diet, I am not so sure there's anything wrong with curating a media diet that is purely nutritious. Right? It's almost as if some people were telling me, you should include some trash food in your media diet it's just <laughs> it's just it's it's just you know variety variety is the spice of life right, right. and i'm like well okay right but i prefer eating healthy and, and that's what it is right so yes i i i try to only listen to people that i like and on twitter i do the same thing like i only follow people that i trust that mm -hmm. i think are saying interesting things I don't really get a lot of value out of like following. I hate following someone. Like mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I'll see their I'll see their most notorious tweets anyway, right? Right. So anyway, that's something. Um, as regards to the thing we wrote in the I uh, wrote in the essay. Yes, I have a big issue with a common thing you'll get accused of as soon as you start speaking very staunchly in favor of particular socialist projects, as opposed to in favor of socialism in the abstract. You instead of saying like. Socialism mm. would be better than capitalism. Nobody can disagree with that. But as soon as you start saying this specific Chinese policy is great, at that point, you start getting a very particular attack from the left, which right. is you just like this because it's it's a red flag. You just like this because it, it makes you optimistic. You're just liking this because it, it, it seems I don't I, I I wouldn't do a fair job of like paraphrasing their accusation but the accusation is something like you just like this because they have a red flag sure and yes and it's crazy because 
then they will invoke, and I, I mentioned some of this, they will invoke, in order to support their positions, a lot of writing that purports to be of a red flag persuasion. Like, it'll be like, I, this, 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 this magazine, like Jacobin Magazine or Navarra Media or Chuang, like, these are, like, I, they're against capitalism. Like, they, they said so. They said they're against capitalism. And I'm like, yeah, but they're citing Adrian Zenz. They're citing the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. They're citing Rushan Abbas. So I, I tell these people, and, and it doesn't kind of connect that, like, they are doing what they were accusing me of doing. They are blindly trusting this entity on account of it having a red flag, or, or not explicitly a red flag, but like calling yourself a socialist. Like, are you actually going to disagree with the uh, Communist Party of India, uh, Marxist-Leninist? And I'm like, well, do you know anything about that part? Do you know, do you know like how many Communist Party of India Marxists there are out there? I, 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 would, I, I don't want to, like, if you go on Wikipedia, right, like, right. There's, there's so many of them, right? And it's like, I'm basically, uh, you're basically told, I found a source that calls itself Marxist, just trust it. Um, I don't know if people, I would say it's better if people read the article, but the, the gist that I, the, what I document in the article is that Chuang is this tiny, tiny, like it doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. It's a tiny, tiny journal that uh, as soon as I started learning about Bolivia, I started following some accounts that were kind of like anti-imperialist. Back then I thought that was, ooh, you know, anti-imperialist, I don't know about that. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I, I was just following them because they, they, seemed, they seemed, they were saying in, in, insightful things. And I started learning a little bit about China. So Again, my focus was Latin America. I was I was all about the Bolivia coup and how the United States was messing around over there. So people start talking about the Xinjiang thing. Um, and the first, I, I swear this must have been the first thing I ever saw about it, was this Chuang article. And people were like, oh, this is like a super cool like communist like a newspaper, whatever. And I look at it, and I didn't like it. I, I just... I didn't like it at all. I, I had heard maybe about Zens before or or maybe it was something else about the I don't think I had actually because I would have I would have screenshotted that. Um I, I think I just read the thing and I was like, this is not convincing. Like this is this is saying a lot of there's a f- couple of highlights I make there where it's like, oh, people here feel this way. They are worried that these accusations may become true. Like the writer of that piece wasn't right. saying this is happening. They're saying the people feel that this could be happening um and i didn't like that i i that already raised red flags and one thing i did know about was the falun gong uh, uh that's it's like a very anti-china but a very mm-hmm. reactionary i didn't know it i didn't know it primarily as like an anti-china thing they knew it as like a generally reactionary thing in north america like they're big in north america so right. if you go to chinatown montreal you see them doing like the like they're usually in chinatown they have their posters are all about like communist oppression and stuff like that. So I knew him from that. And I know that a big claim they make is the organ harvesting because the way that Falun Gong works, and you can see this from their own website, they, they have all these religious beliefs, supernatural beliefs about how the, like, uh, it's a little bit like a, like a pyramid scheme. It's like, oh, if you believe in Falun Gong, you're going to be healthy, miracle cure. So they believe their organs are special. And that ties into the, the whole narrative of organ harvesting, which they've been pushing since the 90s. Like it's, it goes way back. Right, so when right. you see someone talking about organ harvesting, it already raises red flags. And this guy, this super communist journal, like the bare minimum I would expect someone to do is say, the with the person I was interviewing brought up the organ harvesting claims, but there were no there were no there was no evidence. And right. you know, my readers, you should be aware that this is connected to this other thing because I'm a researcher and I want you to have all the information available so you can make your own decision. But there was none of this. It was just name dropped in there. And I got a anyway. So the Chuang article was a bit shady. And the other thing I didn't like is the author, uh, Adam Hunervin. The first thing I do on mm-hmm. everything I read, the absolute first thing I ever do before I dive into any article is Google the person if I don't know them already. Like, I really want to get a sense of who's writing something before I jump into it. And I recommend this to anyone. Just yeah. always, always Google the author. If you are passionate about Bolivia, try to find out what they said about Bolivia. If you're passionate about Iran, try to find out if they ever said anything. Like, try to find out what kind of person you're talking to. Anyway, this Adam Hunervin guy did not exist. Absolutely nothing. Zero. And I was like, well, that's shady. I pointed out it was shady that this, this author just did not exist anywhere online. But I forgot about it because, again, like the article was there and I can just read the article. Much later, much, much later, like this year, like just two years on, 
um, I found out by looking at old notes, oh, shoot, it's Darren Byler. Darren Byler is like uh, University of Colorado, I think. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I put this all in the article. I don't mm-hmm. know off the top of my head. But he's an academic in the United States. He's testified for the government of Canada. He's right. probably called himself uh, China's, uh, uh, he thinks he's the China national enemy. Um, he, he has no problem talking to the Spectator, which is like a right-wing magazine. Uh, he works for the Kissinger, she's a Kissinger Institute fellow, like Wilson Center stuff. Um, so this guy's, as far as I can tell, he's not a communist. He's, he's an anthropologist who, right. who hid his name to write for this journal. And anthropologists, I mean, there's so many anthropologists in the Bolivia context. That, that's kind of how I, I acquired an animosity for the field in general. There are a lot of white anthropologists who write about like Eva Morales, the murder of nature, like uh, uh, neoliberalism with an Indian face, like they, they they use the language, but then you look up their stuff and it's like I don't think there's like they're not they're not affiliated with any parties, they're not affiliated with like even the Democratic Socialists of America, they're not affiliated with anyone. They, they're just right. they're just like a, an anthropologist who can speak the language of the left. Um, right. Just, so, just to sort of yeah. recap on all this, man. Just like listeners, you have to read this guy's article to understand. Where all of this is, he, he very clearly lays this out in that, you know, Chuang is a very small communist hip publication out of China, and there is a dude named Adam Hunter or Hunterven who is yeah. uh, writing. And you look this guy up; he doesn't exist, and you realize it's a pseudonym for a guy named Darren Byler, who wrote a dissertation at the University of Colorado, um, and that dissertation is titled. Weaker dispossession, culture work, and terror capitalism in a Chinese global city. He's basically like, as you as you mentioned in your article, you're he, he's reformatting his thesis for web use, and <clears throat> and so it is a very just first things first thing. You just look up the person who wrote this article, and and it's a it's not the person that they say it is. It's a completely mm-hmm. different person that has Western motivations. It's part of the Kissinger Institute. Um, mm-hmm. And 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 now you understand why they can do things like use sensationalist uh, stuff about organ harvesting or something, and, and not even mention that this uh, stuff originates from Falun Gong propaganda. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, if we're getting all that, if, am I getting that straight so far? Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is that the, it came up recently because somebody made this thread of like, I'm going to make a thread of resources. Nobody in their right mind would ever accuse of being uh Western propaganda. Right. And right. They, they cite, they cite the Chuang piece. It's like, this is a piece from Chinese communists. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, let's put aside, let's put aside entirely the affiliations of, uh, Darren Baylor for a second, but like, there's th- this guy's not Chinese. Like he is extremely white. He's an American guy. Right. So right. like so and so he doesn't. You know what I mean? Like yeah. It's so. Oh, I mean the name and there's Darren this Byler. Byler. For, That's not Chinese. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And and the other thing is that um, a lot of the other articles. I don't actually know who writes. Like, there's another guy who writes for uh, Lao San, uh, Wilfred Chan. He's Chinese. Mm. Um, but I think he's Chinese. Uh, but he. He was like a White House. Uh, he, he uh, what do you call it? Like, he's got a photo or he, a White House intern or something. I need to get the actual thing. But he he he's collaborated with the the of like literal American federal government. So right. they keep saying this thing of like you cannot you cannot say that this person who has claimed to be a socialist is not a socialist. And then they turn around and they're like, well, China is obviously lying. Are we communists? It's it's very paradoxical. It's very frustrating, and yeah, it's like a whole mirror in a way. Also, Chuang, I recommend people to look up the, the sources of things, but also to read the articles carefully. My friend Tom From, uh, like the, my main collaborator in all things online, I just I really trust this guy, and I recommend people follow him. Mm-hmm. But he he did another uh, takedown of a of a Chuang article where it was about the coronavirus, and again, this article is consistently talking about like capitalist repression, totalitarianism, like it's, it's, it's really speaking as if it hated capitalism. Like th- this is unmistakable. You read there the Chuang article on coronavirus in China, and it's unmistakably talking about like all this, it's using left-wing terminology, but it's also, it's also like echoing a lot of the, it's like, uh, there's a, there's a little bit about the diets of people being like, not like, not 
not not okay, or, right, right. or the rumors about the filthy food. Like they never say the same thing. They never say what you would hear from a like a plain racist. They never say what a redditor would say, which is like Chinese people eat bad, man, whatever. But they they will say there are rumors that like the the market conditions, uh, the wet market conditions were unsanitary or something. And it's like it's the same point. It's just dressed up. Yeah, it, and I this... recommend people just read them on their own. Yeah. Sure. That makes yeah. Mind. And and they say, oh, and there's one more thing. And yeah, there's yeah. another thing that bothers me is uh, one thing I really like about Marxism coming from science is on the scientific background, uh, is the ability to make a prediction. Like I think the coup in Bolivia, I didn't know this ahead of time, but I was like I think that the, the in Bolivia the coup is it's a coup. I, I think uh, sorry, I'm misspeaking. Uh, I think what's happening in Bolivia is a coup, and I think Evo Morales is support, right? And I make this, it's a prediction because I don't actually know that. I, I don't actually, like I was hearing Oliver, but I'm taking people's word for it. But I was like, according to my understanding of the political forces, I think Evo Morales had support. And I think the United States is trying to do this. Blah, blah, blah. I need bore out. Like the prediction, my prediction, bore out. So when, an, when, when a magazine like Chuan writes an article on coronavirus at the beginning of the coronavirus and predicts and talks about like the system failing, it basically talks about like there's a breakdown of the of the capitalist system in China, like clearly from, from their poor reaction to the coronavirus, we have seen how capitalism is failing in China. And of course, this is now we know with hindsight that this is completely wrong analysis. Like China handled coronavirus way better than every single Western country, social democrat or whatever you want to call it. Um, and But the, mag like, the article is still there. The article is still sitting there as a, as, a, as a blatant example of a magazine criticizing Chinese capitalism that predicted that like the, the handling was atrocious and very poor and an example of China falling apart. And it's not right. Right. Yeah. No, it's, it's really, <clears throat> I mean, the, the more I read out of your article, the more that, um, uh, you know, it, it's, you so articulately placed uh, it, the connection between the sort of ge geopolitical forces and the narrative and why these things are logically happening. You know, it was, um, mm. you know, like, because, when we start talking about, and I guess I want to pivot from how like individuals interpret media and like general misrepresentation perpetrated by media, mm -hmm. um, to that other component of your article, which is like all the geopolitical and historical narratives driving your thesis, right? Um, yes. But, and, and we'll get into the you know the Cold War aspects and and all of that with it. Um, but yeah, so there is this reoccurring uh, mechanism of dehumanization within the sort of pernicious language that. Uh, that mm -hmm. is, uh, that is saying, oh, well, that's a, it's a country with, uh, hygiene issues. Like they don't, they're a dirty yeah. country or they, the dirty food or what have you. And, and, and mm -hmm. all of this speaks towards this, uh, this, this long and horrible mm -hmm. history of like, uh, Asian dehumanization. Yeah, um, and, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it, it's, it's a slightly like, like, uh, Dr. Oster Bear said, you know, it's a slightly different discourse from like, uh, anti-blackness perhaps. Right. But, but you see the kind of the same thing within, uh, uh, basically any, anybody who's, who's not white, any non-white people, has yes. a global geopolitical mechanism of dehumanization, uh, forwarded by our military and imperial projects. And, um, and you know, you, you had mentioned in this article too, you grew up with like three decades of like the, the war on terror and watching this propaganda machine work, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I guess maybe we could talk about, you pointed out four things like lies about the, um, about the Iraq war or about mm -hmm. the, the invasion of Iraq. And, uh, and, and, and you posit that the, the United States would not invent any less or spend any less effort in their propaganda towards China, Correct. Too, given that they are a, uh, a, a more for, formidable adversary. Uh, we Correct. Say. So Correct. maybe you can speak to those four different, uh, things that were, uh, that were created out of thin air, um, by our government in order to forward the war right. on terror imperial project. So again, like this is not something that I'm an expert in the Iraq war or anything. This is just literally four things that were taken to be true. I, uh, let me go back to a little bit of this. I was in Peru um, when the Iraq war started. And I remember vividly, um, 
uh, I, again, I wasn't like into politics or anything. I was a, just a young kid in Peru. But I remember when people asked me, like, what is your position? And I was like, well, I was leaning. I was kind of like, oh, war is bad, but terrorism is bad. And I was like, um, I, I, I just naively believed a lot of th- things that were in the media. So again, I come back to this thing of I hate being lied to and I hate being wrong. So when I learned that so much of the Iraq war that had tricked me, me was wrong, I decided I need to ensure this doesn't happen again. I don't want to be tricked again. So what are the four lies that I bring up? Um, the first is not like the first I like I heard from people, but like I, I kind of like came into awareness of it as an adult, uh, which was a Naira testimony. A Naira testimony is uh, what, as a testimony given in the United States Congress uh, that where, where a young woman uh, talked about how she had witnessed like uh, Iraqi troops taking out baby taking out babies from baby incubators and like leaving the babies to die while taking the incubators, and this was uh, used to, like to to rally public sentiment into sanctioning Iraq, which began a decade of like suffering in Iraq. So that's like, the Naira testimony. So the, um, the second one I think is the human shredder. This was pushed by a uh, Labour MP in the United Kingdom. She was huge, like uh, Anna. Clyde, I think. Uh, anyway, she pushed it. You can look it up. It's a human shredder. So it was like, oh, there's a human shredder where like Saddam Hussein has this like industrial shredder where he puts his enemies. Sometimes they go head first. Sometimes they go feet first. But like, like at least 30 people have been killed there. And Saddam Hussein's son supervises the whole thing and it's horrifying. And of course, after the invasion of Iraq, this human shredder was never found. Um, then there's, of course, the weapons of mass destruction. Hopefully, I don't need to go into that one. There was nothing ever found there. Right, right, right. And lastly, and lastly, and quite forgotten in some ways, is the, the fact that Saddam Hussein was alleged to have connections to Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. Um, even today, a lot of people, when talking about the war on terror, they will just uh, they will just mix up the two country names up. They'll be like, you know, the invasion of Afghanistan, Iraq, sorry, Afghanistan. Iraq. Like they will just mix the two up because in popular consciousness, it was just one big blob, right? But it was a big part of that propaganda to to associate uh, Saddam Hussein to Osama bin Laden. Um, right, right. Rhetorically, and, and the thing that to, like to, yeah, yeah, and then that's like that that I, I mean, honestly, I wasn't even uh, you know aware of the the Naira. Uh, testimony, but the thing mm-hmm. that got me about her is that one, she's a 15 year old girl that 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 testifies in front of the Congressional Human Rights Caucus in 1990s, mm-hmm. and it turns out that I mean, these sort of human rights uh, accusations, these violations that she was, uh, it's basically the first case of atrocity propaganda because this whole thing was made up and she was actually the Ooh, like the, well, I wouldn't I wouldn't go that was, far I wouldn't call it the oh. first I wouldn't call it the first but yes it's uh it's definitely oh, that is a classic modern, modern example yeah 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 yeah, yeah, Cla- classic yeah, yeah, modern, yeah yeah so um but but she was the daughter of a um of, of yeah. a Kuwaiti ambassador I believe right that, exactly exactly so, exactly so it's so I mean I mean and what we're ultimately trying to like bring forth out of this conversation is the lies that look like truth right in front of your face from the articles that you would read from a trusted outlet that have well, uh you know yeah. things, but but all the way to like our government or, or at least my government in America right and mm-hmm. uh, and, and collaborating with yours most likely as well you know well um, um so yeah i mean it's 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 just astounding the stuff that you brought and forth. There's, there's also so. there's also Amnesty International fully support right. her, right? Like Amnesty International was like, oh yeah, it's totally legit. Like basically, you have two things, right? People are like, I can't trust a random girl. Uh, people are like, I can't trust some random international organization. But then if the two are together, you know, right. like what am I going to say? Who am I? This is the thing that I try to also tell people on Twitter uh, because that's my main medium. Um, I tell people you need to. It sounds a little bit goofy, it sounds a little bit anime, but like you need to believe in yourself. You need to. You need to believe that you can do this research. It's. It's. You. You can. You don't need to trust me. I. I. I always. People have made fun of me. They're like, "Oh, what? You think you're gonna post your way to revolution one screenshot at a time?" And I'm like, "Well, no." But at the same time, I'm putting out this. I'm putting out the research. I'm really trying to tell people, just, just look at it yourself. You can do this. Don't trust me. Don't trust me on anything. Like I'm, I'm just like literally just software developer. Just, I'm putting out the links. I'm putting out the screenshots. Feel free to call me out on it. Uh, as, as you can see from our conversation, I don't remember all the specific details. Uh, like I don't, I don't know exactly what the, all I know is I, I read it. I researched it. I took a screenshot. I put it out there. 
and people can just look at it on their own. Um, and a lot of people just, I understand the fear. People are like, but, but can you just stop point me to somebody? Like, can you just point me to an adult? Like, is there some kind of <laughs> adult entity that can tell me what the truth is? And I'm like, sorry, but no, there is no adult. There is no, there is no entity. People are like, is there anyone that you, you, you trust, like, unfailingly that you can just deposit your faith into? And I'm like, no, they're, they're just, this doesn't exist. I don't, there's no entity out there that I trust uh, unfailingly. I also participate in a lot of discussions of theory. Um, a lot of the thing that I do on Twitter is kind of like bring up old theory. Um, right. And some people are like, are you disagreeing with Mao? And I'm like, yeah, like I've reserved the right to disagree <laughs> with Mao, with Lenin, with Marx. I'm going to disagree with whomever I want. Like, so I think there's, this ten I understand this, there's this tendency to want to kind of like to, to rely on somebody, you know, you want to fall back on something. You want to say like, well, if I'm wrong, it's okay because I was trusting this other entity. And I understand people want that, but when people ask me like, who are, what is this entity for you? I'm like, there is no entity. There is nobody that I trust. There's people I think are worked for, of course. And th that's bit me in the past too. Sometimes sure. you trust someone because uh, I research everything. And if someone sends me a link, I usually, before just resharing it, I, I look it up to make sure I'm not sharing something that's incorrect but what's going to happen eventually is that that takes a lot of time so i start trusting people and occasionally you trust someone that that is like and then they oh sorry they messed up so if they messed up then i messed up so i go, so you develop a sense of trust but if somebody breaks your trust you have to like go back to verifying what they send you you know what i mean Right, I mean, right, right. But I mean, I, this really speaks to like the lived experience of a person who has spent, you know, most of their life under a cloud of propaganda. You know, I mean, we have seen yeah. the reasons they've given us to go to war in the past, and we have absorbed their narratives only to have them go back on those or never find weapons of mass destruction or, mm -hmm. um, you know, clearly invent a problem that warrants a solution that's in line with what they'd like to do, like the Hegelian dialectic sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, problem, mm -hmm. solution, reaction, you know? Um, and, and I think that, you know, in, in a way, it's like that the more that you care about, like, you know, like for yourself, like, you know, wanting those things that are in Canada in, in, in mm -hmm. Peru or in Bolivia, right? The more that you care about human beings, the more that you mm -hmm. care about um, people overseas not getting bombed by your government, the more that you commit and invest into mm -hmm. caring about those things, the right. more susceptible you are to certain forms of propaganda. Like, and going back to something you mentioned earlier in, in the conversation in an article about, uh, I think it was like a Weeder interview or something, uh, where the guy was like, oh, we feel like this is happening, or we hear these rumors and we fear these rumors may come true. You know, even yeah. even last night, I, I found a, a Weeder interview and I started listening to it. And it's it's like, you know, 45 minutes of a guy talking about how I, I'm sure it's unfair to when you step outside of your, your home, mm -hmm. there, there's an ID card request or something, or that you have to yes. show your credentials or something to that end, or that they, that they don't feel that they can, I don't know that they, that they had, that there's a bunch of Han that's a, that's a more populous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, around, yeah. Right. But like these, these things don't amount to charges of genocide, right? Correct. These things don't amount to the, the most uh, damning accusation and serious accusation one country can level at another. And so, Correct. It, so it, it's, you know, I, and I say all that because without this context of like a, a command of world history, materialist analysis, and understanding the geopolitical forces that are at, that are going on right now and what their end games are, um, it, you know, if you're a person that cares about other human beings, which most of most of us are, these stories are going to tug at your heartstrings. They're meant Correct. to emotionally manipulate you into supporting uh, a, a war. And, and at the very least, I mean, even if you don't support, you know, intervention or something of that end, at the very end, it's meant to shape your opinion of, of China as a nation. Correct. And, and Chinese people. And, and also well, make you more yes. susceptible to the shit about eating bats and the other dehumanization. Yeah. Shit. And, and, and it, it sucks because what I tell people too is, you know, as, a social, as an experiment, okay? But like, try to, rather than just react to this news all the time, Try to just offer praise of something that you yourself believe is cool about China. For example, the bullet trains. I love bullet trains. I want bullet trains in North America. Again, it's one, one of those things where I'm like, damn, like, I want that. Um, you can just 
be in a very left liberal sphere, you can just say, you know what? It would be really cool if we had bullet trains in Canada like China does. Or like, have you checked out China bullet trains? It's pretty cool. And people <laughs> will immediately react with this kind of like, oh, that's scandal. The only reason they have bullet trains is because they do horrible things. And it's like, see, this is very <laughs> disciplinary. It's like, it's suddenly people are, are, are unable to, or, or you can say, for example, China has grown economically. Like we're, we're, there's a, um, I mentioned this in the, in the article, but like a, a report for, for the UN from a UN special rapporteur, Philip Alston, and he, he focuses on global pro- poverty and he's, he's, he's an NYU professor. So again, he's not like some radical person, but he talks about global poverty and he's like, yeah, like global poverty, like China has led the, like the, the fight against global poverty without China. Gold poverty would have just flat out increased, but thanks to China, it's actually decreased a little bit because they've done such a good job. You can just mention that. You can just be like, you know, fighting poverty, pretty good. <laughs> but we we'll immediately be like, how can you trust anything they say? So it keeps you very, like, it keeps you very, um, you can see a way forward. Like, a, a lot of socialism in North America focuses on looking backwards on its own history. And again, there's a problem here, because as I explained earlier, with respect to Canada, Canada did not achieve its own successes in a vacuum. I think the social democratic movement in Canada basically was letting the USSR do a lot of the, a lot of the muscle. For, for, they, 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 I don't think there's any explicit acknowledgement of this, but like, I think without the USSR, the barking of the social democrats has no bite, right? Right, right. So, so when, when socialists in the West and... I, I am a, West, a socialist in the West, but I also <laughs> come from further out in the gold periphery. Um, they, don't, they don't look outside. And they don't look to the future. They only look backwards into their own history. So you see a lot of British socialists looking backwards romantically on the British labor movement. And you see a lot of Canadians looking backwards on the Canadian labor movement. But they don't look to China. They, like, they don't look to Vietnam. When people talk about like solutions to the to coronavirus crisis in Canada... They don't look to, they're not like, wow, we should copy Vietnam. They're exclusively, like, it's almost like their brain, their, 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 their line of sight only allows them to discuss, oh, like, this is what New Zealand is doing. This is what Taiwan is doing. This is what, like, only a certain list of countries is, like, approved to be able to be discussed as a role model. Right. So I have, a, know, prob- I, I have a problem with this because I think socialism, again, this is another thing. Uh, I, I mentioned an article by Lasurdo, but there's there's a tendency to want to go back to Marx. Let's go back to the labor movement. Let's go back to basics. And I'm like, actually, we need to be looking forward. There are countries out there that are doing a very good job, and you don't have to adopt their system wholesale, but you need to be actually looking. You need to understand, like, how did Vietnam do it? How did China do it? How did Cuba do it? And we need to look forward, not just backward. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, no worries. Um, yeah, I mean, I want to go back to... You know, as soon as you go from speaking of socialism in the abstract to speaking of socialism uh, as far as real socialist projects happening on the mm-hmm. world stage, right? You know, you say something nice about China. Oh, they, 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 you know, they, mm-hmm. they've really uh, eliminated a, a lot of poverty in China. Mm-hmm. They, mm-hmm. People respond to that. They're like, oh, the only reason they can, you know. <laughs> and, and so, so, but I think that it goes back as well to this sort of, um, I, I think there's a tendency for folks to, uh, for Americans to, when they examine other countries, because their institutions or society or their structural, uh, you know, their architecture mm-hmm. of the country, like, because their democratic institutions are not analogous to ours. Correct. It, correct. Like, they're like, oh, I, I, they couldn't possibly have, you know, uh, and, and this takes, this takes or, the same, this takes the same exact rhetorical form as a right winger in the United States saying we can't have Canadian healthcare because you know, like right, they right. restrict the freedoms, or we cannot have what Sweden has because they're a homogeneous society. Like it's the same kind of like very cheap, very, very lazy, but you hear it from socialists. It's like we can't well, have what China has. I, I was just having this discussion recently about like population uh policies in China, in that, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Bear and our in the last episode mentioned there was a six to one uh ratio of, of children uh to families right so like an average of having six children per family mm-hmm. and so they had uh population policies in place that limit the number of children people families could have and and so i think to uh, to, to westerners 
that really violates this sort of like you this know is, uh this cult of individualism the, the individualist uh the, the 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 sort of notions of personal liberty um that the west has put at the core of their outlooks right so um but because be, be, but they look at that and they, they don't get past that initial critique because in reality, China has a policy that's based out of a materialist situationalist. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the material conditions on the ground? What do we have to do to solve this problem? And very much so. And so the way that they've solved it, sure, it is not consistent with any sort of Western individualist notions, but that was subject to their time and place and history and material conditions. And that's ultimately what Marxism and, you know, co collectivist philosophy to a large degree, more broadly speaking, is about. Correct. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I get what you're saying, man, and that like, you know, we can, what I try and can I give you, yeah, can yeah, I, yeah. I give, let me give you, let me give you another example of this. Okay. So as I said, uh, I started off as a left liberal, I uh, worked as a software developer. One of the topics that, I, and I used to be quite like, not quite anti-China, but I just to be generically anti-China, like everyone else, pretty much, sure. you know, like China, uh, suicide net factory, uh, right. the repression internet, whatever. So as, an, as, a, as a person who loves the internet, like as a, as a Peruvian kid, the internet was amazing for me. Like I was online, I was learning about like, like in Peru, like, I was like, gay people are cool. They're they're good. It's okay. And everyone would be like, that's you know, like uh, right. I I got to see a, pro, a, a a more progressive social scene than the one I was living in. I got to I said marijuana is not like marijuana should not be illegal. <gasps> like scandals. Okay. So the internet for me was huge. I, I I I've seen a lot of horrible things in it, but it was very good for me learning about a world outside of my immediate uh, right. environment. Right. So one of the things I always was like, well, obviously China is bad. Like, there's no question. This is like a, a unquestionable example of Chinese evil. Right. Is the Great Firewall? Is the Great Firewall? Right? Like the, the Great Firewall is just like, oh, how can they monitor all communications and this and obviously repressing information? Information should be free. And I don't want to say that I don't that I don't think free information is good. Like, again, I'm, I'm sharing information. Like, I love people reading my stuff. I don't want it to get banned. But I, I've come to understand that China was, with a great firewall, they were, they were, they were being, I'm talking about it, whatever trade-offs they are, like, it's very likely that they took the, the, the better, the better side, the better option. Because why? Um, in Peru right now, we're doing horrible with respect to COVID. Uh, it's, it's been atrocious. It's been extremely poorly handled. And one thing that that really bothered me um, was the amount of disinformation regarding a vaccine. There's a lot of anti-vaxxer stuff floating around. Right. And moreover, the way this anti-vaxxer stuff has become uh, enter society is via WhatsApp. WhatsApp is super dominant in Latin America. Like it's huge in Brazil, huge in Peru. It's 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 just extremely, extremely dominant. And it was interesting because I was talking to family members and they were, they basically got all this like, how can I put this? It's like the sewage from American media ends up in Peruvian informational shores. So my, mm -hmm. like my dad, for example, would have like very strong opinions about Nancy Pelosi and Adam Schiff. And I'm like, <laughs> this is, this is irrelevant to your life. First of all, like forget of good or bad. Like there's no reason you need to have strong opinions about Adam Schiff or Nancy Pelosi. Second of all, a lot of this anti-vaxxer stuff was getting in. And so what can Peru, which is like a 30 million person country, like what can it do? Like we don't we don't have um we don't have a great firewall. Like so WhatsApp is just like a, a, an open medium where like information can flow in. There's zero control. The government has no control over it whatsoever. And basically, yeah, like in Brazil, the, the Bolsonaro campaign, uh like you can see videos of people in his rallies chanting like what? WhatsApp, WhatsApp, Facebook, Facebook. And it's like, yeah, like the, the linkage between WhatsApp, Facebook, and Bolsonaro um, is huge there. And if your country has no great firewall, then you have nothing. Additionally, it's also a brilliant move from an industrial perspective. I'm a software developer. Hey, I, I may have liked to stay in Peru and be a software developer, but of course, um, we have no moat 
So if you start an app it's gonna, and it's any good at all, probably going to get your lunch eaten by some Silicon Valley yeah, company. Because again, yeah. right? So anyway, so what am I getting back to? What I'm getting back to is that China has a very unsentimental approach uh, to doing the, the right thing for its own country. And a lot of people just don't like that. They're like, how can, like, Americans love saying this thing of like, I would rather, no, what is that famous phrase? It's like, I don't agree with you, but I will oh, right, fight right. to the death for I'll you to say whatever right to say it right 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 and i'm like okay that's that's a sentiment but it's not an objectively correct sentiment like there's no reason why china should sacrifice risk the entire health of the chinese people on a commitment to free speech like i'm, right. I'm not necessarily saying that free speech is bad or anything like that i mean i tend to think it's a bad core value but but what i'm saying is that americans treat china having a different set of values in that regard as in itself a crime. And it's like, no, China, China is not pretending to have free speech. They, they, they don't even pretend to that. They just say, we have a great firewall, and that's that's what it is. We have it for reasons. Deal with it. Right. And, you know, and so you're talking about, like, uh, issues about censorship and free speech, which are obviously related, and they're uh, in our national conversations, uh, you know, over here. But, like... You know, it, it's. I look at China, and you're right. The Great Firewall thing. Uh, maybe they did get a really good trade off in that because when when it comes to censorship, I mean, if we can look to what happened with Myanmar recently, with like a genocide that was incited on Facebook because it's. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if many people know about this, but the the same sort of like policing that Facebook does in America, which is not a very good job that they do on on American networks anyway. Um, but mm -hmm. they don't have any like content policing. Uh, in 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 the global south, uh, and and so they don't take the policing of that content seriously. And there is like an actual like an actual genocide that's been incited through Facebook, where, mm -hmm. and you can see. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'll leave a New York Times link on that, like a liberal bastard of truth or whatever. Fuck New York Times, you know. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, but they, I mean, it's it's really true, and and that is related to um, the free speech thing, as you say, because in here's China, a here's a wait here's a fun fact. Yeah, Facebook used to be able to operate in China. Like, Facebook has not always been banned in China. Facebook actually was banned in China as a result of the reluctance to allow the Chinese government to monitor and control the spread of news via Facebook, precisely related to the violence in Xinjiang. I don't have the article in front of me, uh, but I can dig oh, something wow. up for your listeners. So sure. the reason, the reason Facebook is not allowed in China is not some blanket anti-Facebook policy that China had, but it's precisely linked to the violence in Xinjiang. Another interesting thing, I've thought about writing it into one of the essays, but again, it's always hard to, so a lot of stuff gets left in the cutting room. Right, right. Yeah. So you're saying that... Um... That Facebook and its banning from uh, being banned from China has to do with the stuff going on in, in, in Xinjiang right now um, because of the spreading of, of that information, which is clearly not going to help the, the PRC um, or, or the Chinese Communist Party at that point, um, which mm -hmm. is, you know, I, I it's I mean, I, I think critics would look at that either way. But I think that, you know, if may you, I, may I just uh, just to be, sure. to be fully clear, uh, yeah. if you go to Wikipedia censorship of Facebook. Yeah. In China, Facebook was blocked following the July 2009 Urumqi riots because Xinjiang independence activists were using Facebook as part of their communications network, and Facebook denied giving the information of the activists. Of course, this is Wikipedia. You should understand, like, uh, from the perspective of China, independence activists are the terrorists, right? So anyway, <laughs> Facebook was blocked from China precisely because it was being used to organize what, according to the Chinese government, the violence in Xinjiang. So. Yeah, that, like just to be clear, wow, it's, again, wow. yeah, I yeah. probably maybe I'll maybe I'll weave that into the article if you find it that interesting. I, 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 it's one of the many things that we're left in the cutting. No, but, floor, but I think but it's very a, interesting. I, no? I think it's a really, um, a really cool, um, thing to bring up. You know, I mean, just to stay on the topic for a second of like the free speech thing, man, because. You know, in the United States, people die on that hill all the time in their rhetoric, right? They argue absolute free speech and all of that, um, but like it, even in places that. Like uh, like in Australia, their free speech laws are different. Like you can't yell a racial slur at somebody. Like you will get mm -hmm. thrown in jail, or or that is there is ostensibly like a punishment that dissuades that from happening in society. And mm -hmm. and as a consequence, I I think their levels of hate crimes and and things like that are not nearly as high as the United States. And maybe racial tension mm -hmm. is, is 
lower at that, at that point as well. And I don't want to like keep too much praise on the Australian government because ultimately <laughs> they're part of like, they are yeah, part yeah, of yeah. You know, what we're talking about uh, in terms of bad faith, bad faith actors and stuff like that here. Um, but going back to like some of the some of the questions that I had drafted is we drifted kind of far, but I think it was really great to to talk about that stuff because uh, again it just goes back to you know it, it, I tell folks instead of comparing America's institutions to another country and then immediately disliking that country or finding a reason to dislike that country because they don't stack up analogously to our institutions right is to judge a country from like where they came from like exactly exactly literacy rates judge them on their 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 poverty rates judge them on the pro on on their life expectancies you know mm -hmm. and, and look at those graphs and numbers and see if if society for those people has improved because that's the point of, 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 of socialism and socialist project is to raise everyone out of poverty, to have, you know, like a, a widespread moderation of stuff and not necessarily like this Americanized individual. I have everything. You have nothing sort of result of a rigged capitalist system. So, um, so, so uh, yeah. let me just say something. Okay. Let me just try to bring this to the Marxism a little bit. Cause as I said before, I think Marxism is fantastic. I think people should study Marxism. The only problem is that just as with everything else, I think a lot of the Marxist stuff out there is bad. Like I have the luxury that my friend Tom, uh, Tom Frome, uh, was always there to answer my questions. And, and he's read like so much. He's like, just, right, right. Uh, like um, a one-man library. So I could always ask him and he, he would have, he would be like, oh, Harvey, he's not very good. And I'll be like, oh, wow, like Harvey's like what everyone's recommending, right? So it was very nice to meet someone that had like, like a guide into the Marxist world, because I think if you just go in solo, you can get misled. But anyway, if you have a strong Marxist foundation, and particularly the kind that Tom and I argue for a lot, um, it focuses on different things. It focuses a little bit less on like the specific kind of like, I don't want to, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth. Basically, I, I love some of Marxist writing specifically as it pertains to like materialism and idealism. Okay. Um, and one, there was an amazing, amazing article called, uh, on the Associated Press, AP, where it says, mm -hmm. Pompeo says U.S. should limit which human rights it defends from July 16, 2020, okay, by Ben Fox. Right. I'm going to read two little excerpts from it. So Pompeo said, um, Pompeo, speaking in Philadelphia, singled out property rights and religious freedom as the foremost principles in a speech that elsewhere complained about the proliferation of protections and international agreements related to human rights. Okay, so Pompeo is saying freedom of, uh, uh, freedom of religion, number one, and also property rights, number one. Like, those are the two core principles. And elsewhere, the report did not produce any specific recommendations that steered clear of endorsing policy proposals. But experts who parsed it for direction noted, for example, they referred to abortion and same-sex uh, same marriage not as rights, but as divisive, divisive social and political controversies. Now, what am I, what about, I, I think, even though Pompeo is the exact opposite of a Marxist in, in, the, in right, the advancing right. socialism sense, what Pompeo and the United States is demonstrating here is that in pushing religious rights and property rights, they have like a perfectly symmetric or complementary pair of rights. You are defending in the terrestrial world the right of people to like own industry and rejecting any kind of collectivist ownership or whatever. It's property rights, individualism. Right, right. And you're complementing it with religious rights, which is kind of like completely abstract, right? It's just completely, it's, well, worshiping in, in person, has some traits and stuff, but religious freedom pushed in the way the United States pushes it, they complement each other so well. You know what I mean? You got like a perfectly ideal right and a perfectly material right. And they complement each other in this wonderful way. And I think, yeah, like I, I think this is fascinating, and 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 it shows that the United States has come up with like a very good way to manage the contradictions of capitalism. Well, not a very good way. It's kind of started to break apart and fail. It, it sounds but like they, the politics like, of whiteness, man. It sounds like the yeah. politics of whiteness. It's just like you know, those are the property owners, and those are the, um, you know, it, it's like so much of whiteness is just property rights. You know, um, so much of uh, of American supremacy is rooted in uh, the right to own property or mm -hmm. own, own industry, own the means of production. 
and, uh, and, and, and dialectically creates those that do not own uh, as well. So exactly. So if you if you look at this, do you have the, in the United States, you have a situation of like property owners and the, the like religion can act precisely as Mark said. I, I have nothing against religion per se, but like it can act as an opiate, right? Like a lot of people can be told it's going to get better in the next life. Like don't worry sure. about your don't worry about your your current situation. When you die, you're going to go to the afterlife. So there's just like it's a, it's they work together really well, right? So right. when we go to China. When we go to China, I tell people, like, yeah, it's exactly what you're saying. Like, China is concentrated on the material every, like, there's no shortcuts there. You know what I mean? Right. Like, it's, it's your, it's your, are your kids going to have a better life than you are? Um, is public transit getting better? Is the, are the rivers getting cleaner or whatever? Like, when, when I talk to friends that go to China, um, they tell me, yeah, they're impressed by what's happening. It's not this abstract notion of improvement. It's not this abstract notion of like, oh, I have this right. Like, I, I, I like, I, I've come to really dislike the right to free speech in the sense that like people are so proud of it, even though they don't even use it. It's, it's just this pride in something that doesn't even exist for the most part. You can. So this is why I think it's important to go back to materialism, uh, measuring, measuring empirical things measuring actual improvements and not vaingloriate so much about something that's abstract and, ima and essentially well, imaginary. I mean, I mean, staying with the abstract stuff for the, for the time, you know, I think that this abstract notion of improvement that you were talking about, like how it's, it's not that it's rooted in material things. Right. Um, mm -hmm. within the, within the West, you see this sort of abstraction within this, uh, this narrative of like always marching forward, towards progress you know mm -hmm. um which which you know that narrative is like uh it's kind of being rewritten in that like uh actually y'all didn't march towards progress you uh you recruited nazis after world war ii and let them hang out <laughs> yes in new york and they they are resurgent within the united states as capitalism fails and the american empire crumbles and so mm -hmm. uh, the forward marching progress narrative is being called out questioned and undermined um and so uh, maybe that can get us over to the other the other part of this man which was like you know the narrative of of america being you know the premier global superpower right um that is being called into question perhaps before america even uh thought it would be uh, earlier than expected mm -hmm. by things like the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Absolutely. Uh, and, and so uh, you mentioned stuff about the Belt and Road Initiative and how there's like a geopolitical meta narrative for that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but it's also related to things like uh, uh, the Afghan trap doctrine by Zbigniew Brzezinski. Um, mm -hmm. Could you possibly <laughs> walk us through like, I, I mean... Yeah, so so in the article, in the article, I make like a very like... Uh, again, I'm not an expert of Xinjiang, but I basically say this is my understanding of the situation. Okay, so number one, the United States uh, did not expect China to to skyrocket the way it has recently. I genuinely think they were a little bit caught off guard by the rise of Xi Jinping, who, according to WikiLeaks cables from like the 2000, uh, well, I don't know what the year is, 2010, maybe 2008, 2009, some WikiLeaks cables talk about Xi Jinping, and there's this stuff of like, oh man, this guy's like actually a communist like he's very <laughs> red and he's and he's apparently not interested in money like uh oh problem and then the belt and road initiative is just very smart like uh, again i don't study the belt and road initiative in super detail but you, you hear about it i recommend that the, uh, the tricontinental is like a uh, vijay prasad is very involved with that publication oh yeah they got an vijay, article yeah. called uh, the erosion of u.s control and a multipolar future twilight yeah. um from january 4 this year I recommend reading it. it. It talks exactly about this. It's the rise of China um, and how their, their GDP is going to eclipse uh, the U.S. GDP by any measure by 2030 and stuff like that. Okay, so number one, China is rising and, and it's not rising in this kind of like, oh, Gorbachev kind of way. It's actually like apparently <laughs> Xi Jinping is the real deal. Right. Okay. Uh, number two, uh, so I mentioned the Afghan trap. Uh, the idea is that when the U.S. was faced with the Soviet Union, they didn't, uh, they didn't in the late years, they invaded it in 1918, but they didn't invade it ever since. So what they did was um, they helped the Taliban, uh, no, the Mujahideen, uh, siege 
Afghanistan, which uh, Afga Afghanistan was aligned with the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union retaliated by sending the army, uh, and they were dragged into like a like a ten year long conflict, which in that interview, uh, Brzezinski refers to as like the Soviet Union's Vietnam. It just like sapped all the energy from the Soviet Union. It made it extremely unpopular internationally. They lost a lot of allies. They appeared to everyone, including Deng Xiaoping, as like a hugely imperialist force that was going to take over the world. It was just like a like um like a very smart move, right? So this is achieved not by the United States going in itself, but by arming the Mujahideen. And the Mujahideen sieges uh, the, the region, and then the Soviet Union sent in the army, and it created this uh, like dramatic standoff. Now, point number three is that I argue that China uh, basically said we're not going to send in the People's Liberation Army. We are going to we're going to do it something different. We're going to react, as you said, again. Ignoring a lot of like our attachment to like uh, civil liberties and like free speech and things like that, they basically went in and we're like we're gonna like in, like we're gonna put a lid on this terrorism thing. Like no more WhatsApp groups, no more of this nonsense. Like uh, we're gonna give people jobs, we're gonna give people free schooling, we're gonna we're gonna offer whatever we need to do. Well, I mean, this was the rhetoric around the war on terror in two thousand one. Like, I remember people were like, oh, like, the United States shouldn't build bombs, they should build schools, right? Like, people used to talk about the, the, the war on terror in those terms. I don't remember a single person reacting to, uh, in 2001, to the, to, to the attacks with, oh, the United States should do nothing. Like, that, that was out of the question. Like, the United right. States was going to react to it in some way. The question was, do you react to it with bombs or with, like, education, right? So right. I think for me, it was, I, I argue, like, it seems to me like China said, let's not uh, send in the military and do some like draconian thing. Let's actually create jobs. Let's vocational schools. Again, it's not like there's no evidence of this. Like the BBC has gone into one of these centers and done this horrible documentary that's like, oh, it's so horrible. But you, you actually see people are dancing. They have computers there. They're learning stuff. And like they, they try to spin it as this kind of like horrific thing. But what you get on the camera, is, and there's another guy, Olsi Jazeksi, I'm pronouncing his name wrong, I think he's based in Turkey, but he also went, and he's interviewing these kids who are wearing uniforms in like a, in like a library setting, and the kids are saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm an atheist, and he's like, this is, this is what China's doing to these people, and he's like, look, I mean, I know he's upset that like some, so many kids are going atheist, but so are evangelicals, you know, like, um, that, like, nothing you see in this video of him in the camps is horrifying, it looks like a school. So, so number three is that China um, is, is, is handling terrorism in this way. And you can have your qualms with it, but it's just the response to it. And number four is, of course, that because the United States is seeing China handle this intelligently, as opposed to sending in the army, well, I don't want to say the Soviet Union was unintelligent, but like anyway, instead of sending in the army, they're sending in schools, the United States immediately pivots to this narrative of like, um, it's ge cultural genocide, genocide, forced labor. Honestly, they claim a bunch of contradictory things. Some One day, it's like they're trying to do forced intermarriage. Another day, they're trying to eliminate everyone with COVID. Another day, it's uh, organ harvesting, hair harvest. Like, it's just all. It's just like a throw everything at it. It's just horrible. Whatever's happening there, details don't matter much. It's just horrible. So, so right. the four steps are. So, so again, to re recap, the four. My theory, and I'm open to discussing it with anyone uh, that has a different opinion, but it, but is number one, uh, China r rose faster than expected. Like the the rise of Xi Jinping was not something they had really counted on. Number two, uh, they try to they they are they have proxy militias in the region. They're arming to to uh, like to do terrorism and separatism. China reacted to those with schools, and in response to those schools, the United States pivoted to the uh, cultural genocide narrative. That is my theory. Open to discuss it with anyone. But I support it with fact. And like, that's what I'm trying to say, right? Like, I, I say, what I want from any story that attacks China is I don't even want need for them to concede morality to the Chinese, but at least concede rationality. Like, if China is not doing <laughs> what they claim they're doing, if China is not doing what they claim they're doing, then what? What? Like, why are they doing the other thing? Like, why are they doing these horrific things they're accused of? What is the logic? Because China obviously wants the Belt and Road Initiative to succeed. They want to make money. So, what's the logic? 
And I think on this count, it's disgraceful. Like, people don't even bother. Like, the idea that the Chinese are evil and irrational is so entrenched that people don't need to explain anything. It's just like, you can't understand those people. Yeah. Anyway. You know, yeah. So, so, you know, you also pointed out that when we talked about the Afghan trap, we basically take that situation between the Afghan USSR war that the U.S. funded mm -hmm. and it sapped all you know political capital out of the USSR to continue and undermine them on the world stage. And eventually mm -hmm. these, these pressures, um, I'll use the word implode uh, in, in quote, scare quotes, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the, these pressures ultimately led to the collapse of the USSR. And mm -hmm. so if you take a situation like that, and you transplant that onto uh, the Uyghur situation, basically the National Endowment for Democracy, which thank you for linking to that tweet, man, <laughs> um, uh, on December 10th, 2020, they tweeted out, to further hashtag human rights and human dignity for all people in China, the National Endowment for Democracy has funded Uyghur groups since 2004. Which yeah, means they're open about it. That, yeah, they're open about it, which means that they are... Um, they are funding the Uyghurs in the same way that we funded the the, the Mujahideen, um, mm -hmm. which which you know inevitably became you know the the, the people involved in 9/11, right? Um, mm -hmm. But but the Mujahideen, we we have funded their extremist separatists in a way of coaxing uh, China into their own sort of Vietnam or their own reenactment of yeah. the Afghan Soviet thing, and instead of responding by sending the armies in or what have you, because China clearly as a rational country rooted in materialism has said, hey, you know, maybe sending in an army to our Western territory is not really good for our mm -hmm. multi-trade Belt and Road Initiative mm -hmm. ambitions here. Um, and so they respond with educational camps, which is why they're called educational camps, you know, or re-education. Mm -hmm centers, what have you. And so mm -hmm. because of this pivot that was, again, another unexpected thing by the United States playing in this geopolitical theater, um, they have now started to throw any accusations against China that they can, whether it's recycled mm -hmm. Falun Gong stuff about mm -hmm. um, about the uh, organ harvesting, whether it's mm -hmm. about making COVID-19 in a laboratory, whether it's about, uh, you know, this stuff, uh, it, them allowing it to or China allowing COVID to to uh, to transmit freely on purpose. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, every single, including accusations of genocide, they have thrown against China with perhaps the end goal, not necessarily being able to show that they were committing genocide because they're not, but the, perhaps just showing, uh, perhaps getting them to, at least on the world stage, to be seen as a violator of human rights, to discredit yeah. China, to um, sty stymie their, their progress towards the Belt and Road Initiative and overtaking uh, America as the premier global superpower. Um, and yeah. So, so that's what you're positing, and I I tend to agree with you on all of that stuff because again, it's like if you it, you have to look at this from like the geopolitical narrative, and you're right, don't, you don't have to concede morality, but rationality. Like there's there's no reason or no incentive that I can think of that China would want to do this. Um, you know, would want to actually commit genocide in the full force and weight of that word. Exactly, and, and again, I, I'm not an expert in Xinjiang. I, it's funny, when I first made my thread, the original one from July 2020, I some people started quoting me like, this guy's been to Xinjiang, he knows his stuff. And I was like, bro, calm down. Like, I have not been to Xinjiang. I do not know. Like, I, wa I want to go. But um, but yeah, people started kind of like quoting me as like, I know everything. And I'm like, listen, my approach is not to say I know everything. My approach is simply to demand that the people that are putting facts in front of my face have the, the decency to treat me like an intelligent person and like, you know, ask the ask the questions and assuage my doubts. And like, yes, I think there is a pointed point, like it's a gaping hole from everywhere from democracy now to the intercept to whomever you want to bring up. Like nobody has, nobody makes the case of why China would want to do this. Like why? Like, and, and again, okay, I want to tie two things together. Um, it's interesting because there's all these like, Kind of like token gestures that 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 people have uh, shown me that China has done towards inclusion of the Uyghur population. So, for example, the Uyghur scripts in their currency, right? And mm -hmm. they have like a massive superstar called Dilraba Dilmurat, and she is of uh, she's ethnic Uyghur, and she's like huge in China, massive. Um, and and there's all this stuff like affirmative action in schools. There was an article from 2017 
where they, they scolded China for their anti-free speech because they banned anti-Muslim insults in social media um, or anti-religious, whatever. So, so it's interesting, right? Because you have this stuff where um, China is actively suppressing hatred against Muslim people and, and encouraging them. Again, I, I list a bunch of examples of this in my article, but I'm like, make this make sense. Like, my understanding of fascism, which I go into great detail in that article, is that fascism is a product of capitalism in decay. Uh, as Franz Fanon put it, what is fascism but colonialism at the heart of traditionally colonialist countries? Like it's a, a grab for it's it's an attempt to manage uh, the national situation. And and what does fascism do, especially in Nazi Germany, is creates a national enemy. Like the idea is that there needs to be a, a national enemy. So, so people just throw this accusation of like China is doing like the Nazi thing all over again. And I'm like, can you walk me through exactly like the whole having a national enemy is the whole point of fascism. The idea and and Matt Iglesias from Vox.com said, you know, I'm coming around to the idea that like the way to unite America is to just hate the hate on China. And it's like we can bring everyone around in America, like from all political persuasions, to hate on China, and that would unite the country. And I'm like. That's fascism. That's that's exactly what it is, right? So, so I just I'm want to clarify people, for a second. Matthew Iglesias is the founder of liberal publication Vox, saying that the the unifying project that we need is like anti Chinese policy, which is it, just wild for him to say the quiet part out loud like that. Yes, absolutely. I I mean, again, I don't understand how that tweet didn't get more traction. Like Matthew Iglesias seems, seems, continues to be friends with like lefty media people. Like I don't understand. Like for me, that was just admitting something huge right there. He deleted the tweet, I think. But anyway, it didn't get much traction. So what I'm trying to ask people is, okay, my understanding of fascism is that you create a public enemy to distract people from their decaying conditions, which is exactly what Matthew Iglesias says. He's like, America is having like riots on the streets. Why don't we just make up a Chinese boogeyman and like we can just rile everyone up against the war. The war is good economically in some ways, whatever. We can just hire everyone as a soldier. God knows what he's thinking. Yeah, But right. the idea is that you and we've seen this in America. Like when America wanted to go to the Middle East, twenty four seven, it's like Muslims are the enemy. Like you're consistently hearing of like uh, Muslim crimes, Muslim terrorism there and here, whatever. So I'm asking, can you show me any evidence of this happening in China? Like China is not. It's, it's doing the opposite. It's trying to. So people are like, oh, it's just stealth genocide. Well, if it's stealth, then it's not so fascist, is it? Because the whole point of fascism is the public enemy thing. And if there's no public enemy, then you know what I mean? Like, there's this disconnect, there's this disregard for 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 a, a coherent narrative or a theory tying it all together. It's just facts. It's like potatoes in a sack. It's like here are some horrible things. Now you have to believe me. And it's like no, you have to reject that. I I commented to a friend that you know, reading the news without a theory of the world mm -hmm. that is either agreeing with your theory or challenging your theory is like going outside on the sun without sunscreen. Like you need to, maybe not the best analogy, I don't know, it's not particularly <laughs> elegant, but the <laughs> idea, but yeah, the, yeah. yeah, but the idea is that when I read the news, I have a theory and it's like, I, I have a model of what's happening for any particular situation. If I don't know anything about the situation, I just orient myself. Basically, it's like, who's rich, who's poor, whatever, but I have a model. And if, if the story challenges my model, I try to adapt my model. And if the story agrees with my model, well, it agrees with my model, so it's, it's fine, I Yes, but but you need a theory, and I think a lot of people consume each additional news story without any kind of. It doesn't add up to anything. It's just oh, I, I heard a new bad thing. Can I can I deny the bad thing or not deny the bad thing? And it's like no, this is not good enough. Really, I mean it's good enough, but like you need to have a theory of how the world works, of how actors operate, what their rational moves are to understand it. And this comes back to RussiaGate. I was very skeptical of RussiaGate. I was like, what exactly does Putin get either way. Like, right. like I was like, Russiagate was a full bloom. 2018 was like mega Russiagate. Everyone was talking about Russiagate. My dad was talking about Russiagate in Peru, even though, again, I don't know why. <laughs> right, right. Um, and it's like, I kept asking people, okay, okay, so Putin got Trump elected so that Trump could uh, like continue the, the siege of Syria and Venezuela who are Putin's allies. So what's the logic here? Like, right, right. And right. Like, it's like, so I, I never delved deep into Russia. There were people who were like, just every email, they were looking at every email, every line, like they, all these names became like common parlance. People are pronouncing 
like Russia and Ukrainian names all over the place. I just didn't care enough. I just didn't care to dive deeply. But I, again, I just had my one tool, which is asking people, okay, Putin installed Trump. Well, okay. So what did he get out of it? Like, w- like, how does this work out? Like, what was the bounty? Or like, oh, yes. I, I, I don't know. Like the fall of America. Like, you know what I mean? It's right, very right, right. vague. It's very, it's very well, full of narrative. So we, I can see, yeah. we can see things, man. Like, uh, I mean, it goes back to the Althusserian notion of like the ideological state apparatuses, man. Just we saw the the uh, the frequency of like the the Muslim big enemy portrayed in movies and cinema and video games and stuff mm-hmm. kind of fall off and gradually get replaced. With, like, wait a second, Stranger Things are the bad guys or <laughs> are are Russians yeah. or communists, man? Or like, yeah, yeah, and, then, yeah, yeah. And, then, and then the Chernobyl documentary or the Chernobyl movie from HBO. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, and I, yeah. I, I when you were putting this stuff out in your article, I was just like, oh yeah, that's you know, this is all at the height of Russia Gate, and then all of a sudden we've had to pivot over to China being the big enemy now. Um, and, and so in, in China being the big enemy and, and pivoting to there, man, um, I just I just think it's, it's you know, when you talk about the Russia gate and, and you talk about uh, the maybe some of the reinforcement of all this, whether it's Rachel Maddow with her theories, right? Whether it's uh, Adam Schiff talking about Russia and, and our government. I mean, these things have a role, right? And 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 so we'd be naive to think that the rhetoric coming out of people like Chip Roy, it, it, that's like, uh, I don't know if you caught that, like the day after the Atlanta shootings, he was uh, making references to lynching and talking about anti-communism and how the, the calling the chai comms the enemy and the bad guy like this this rhetoric is is linked intrinsically to uh to some of the, the to the events and the violence that we're seeing against asians in america the further uh mm-hmm. you know, sort of uh the further sort of dehumanization and and marginalization of asian peoples uh especially within american society um i i just you know all of this man it, it's it's like reading your article was like a lesson that that Althusser would have clapped for in a way, you know. Like, so I, I really think it's remarkable uh, that you pointed well, all you. this stuff out. Yeah, man. Um, um, I just I kind of got to round things out a little bit, but uh, what were you going to say? Uh, I was going to say, I have a maybe like a preview. I don't know if I'll actually end up writing this, but there's been a a lot of talk about like the growth of QAnon in the United States, and people right, talk about right. like the risk of QAnon going mainstream. People talk about like, oh, QAnon is growing. Like they make these like pieces, investigative journals. Oh, I lost my mom to QAnon. My mom became crazy. Like they, she's talking about like, oh, the storming of the Capitol. It's crazy what's happening to QAnon, QAnon, QAnon. Right? And right, people right. talk about the risk of QAnon becoming mainstream, but like I want to write an article kind of arguing like QAnon is already mainstream. Like sure, when yeah. people hear QAnon, people talk about like FEMA camps. Like, because you hear these right wingers from like the deep south or whatever, they're like, Obama was sent like creating camps where they sent people to like uh, brainwash them into atheism and feminism. And like the like, I'm pretty sure maybe organ harvesting is also part of it. But like, they're talking about like these FEMA camps, FEMA camps, right? That's a that's a thing, right? Everyone knows about the FEMA camp like mm-hmm. rhetoric that right wingers use. So people talk about like, oh, this is this this is a danger. This is going to become mainstream. And I'm like, this is already mainstream. Like the way that a QAnon Texan or Floridian talks about California is the way that a Californian or New Yorker talks about China. Like QAnon rhetoric is already mainstream. It's just pointed at someone else. So I don't know. People people have this idea they will recognize fascism. They'll be like, oh, when it's coming, I'll see it coming. Believe me, I'll I'll spy. Right, right, it's like, right. I don't I don't think I think this is wrong. I think, or at least I mean, maybe people do have the ability to to detect it in mass, but like they need to put in the work. Like you're not just gonna see it's not fascism in America is not gonna look like QAnon. QAnon will be part of it, but fascism in America looks like the red, white, and blue. You know what I mean? Like right, it, right, it's, right. It's, it's, I, I love yeah. this quote that you had from your article that was like. Contrary to what I was taught in school, fascism describes not an incomprehensible mass delusion, but the rational consequence of capitalists constructing a scapegoat to divert the attention of the angry, deprived masses. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah that's my th- that's my theory of fascism. Again, I um, I didn't study this. <laughs> this is funny, right? I get into arguments with people, and they're like, "Oh, have you read this? Have you read that?" I haven't read all the things yet. I I'm I'm just kind of I'm working as I go. 
And that's another thing I tell people. Don't be afraid to just jump into these things. Don't be afraid to develop an opinion of Marx that could be wrong. Just use your definition of, Mar of Marxism, of, of dialectical materialism. Like, I, I actually joke with my friend uh, Tom a lot. Like, what is the definition of dialectics? Like, I, like, I, I use dialectics, I think. I, I, I like the concept. I don't have, like, a hard definition, you know? But I still use it. I'm just, I'm working with what I have. And I tell right. people, just jump into this. This, this Marxist-Leninism stuff, it's for, it's for you to use. It's for the worker. It's not for some academic to gatekeep you and tell you, oh, you're using it wrong. You haven't read, like, this special guy. No, just, just take this theory and start applying it today to, your, to whatever you want. If you like Bolivia, do Bolivia. If you like Iran, do Iran. If you like China, do China. If you like your workplace, do your workplace. But, like, start actually kind of, like, using this method of analysis to, to make predictions, like, ask yourself okay I, I, you can even be reading a news article and be third paragraph in and i'm like Ooh, i'm learning about this new topic i'm gonna make a prediction like is it gonna pan out or not like oh they're gonna reveal whether this guy's a loser or not like what's your prediction based on what you heard of him and then you you start developing a sense for like a of like understanding history not understanding history as a bunch of potatoes in a sack but like as, as a set of actions and reactions and as a set of forces and tendencies and then for me, that's Marxist Leninism. For me, that's Mar Marxism. For me, that's like, um, yeah, like people talk about fascism as like a set of symbols. It's like fascism is when there's a powerful leader. I actually don't even like um, Umberto Eco's uh, Science of Fascism or Timothy right, Snyder's. Right. I think there's a lot of things where like these are the seven signs to look out for, and it's like <laughs> I, 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 again, I don't know. Like um, some of them are good. Like fascism, fascism will portray the enemy as strong and weak at the same time. Okay, I think that's that's correct. I, I like that one. But there's a lot of stuff. It's going to be like it's going to have a red, like it's going to have a red flag. And it's like, yeah, you know, yeah. like it's going to have a powerful. It's going to have a powerful leader. I'm like, I, I mean, a powerful leader is also going to be the good guys have powerful leaders too. You know what I mean? Like, um, people need to 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 have theories that aren't just descriptive. But that, that they are actually able to use to understand the world. For me, that's yeah. Marxism. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I I agree with you as far as like fascism being. I mean, the reason why it's so notoriously difficult to define concisely is because it is not that it is it is this sort of shapeless, formless uh, thing that flows through society that appears uh, to in varying degrees. Uh, it, whenever capitalism fails, which the failures are a feature of capitalism anyway, that, that you know, it, like capitalism breaks down, and when capitalism it breaks down, yeah. it, it is yeah. capitalism in decay, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and going back to like, I love what you said at the start of this, where you were like, you know, talking about, hey, you need to believe in yourself that you can do this research too, that um, you need to demand <laughs> that these people treat you like an intelligent person who, uh, you yes, know, who, yes, can, yes, who yes, can figure yes. out pseudonyms and stuff like that, right? I mean, the, yeah. and, and as far as making predictions are concerned, I mean, like, it's when you say that to me, because I know this, but maybe to listeners that you, you might be thinking, what is he? That might be more like generating wild conjectures rather than generating. Mm -hmm. But but this stuff is actually more plain as you're just like your article kind of, you know, spells out. But this stuff is actually just plain and it's right there in front of you. And these predictions aren't conjectures there. They're just like logical extensions that are right there in front of you. Like if you talk about, I mean, even the Bolivian coup thing where Elon Musk tweeted about it, about how he needed, uh, exactly. you know, we will coup wherever we want to. They went in and get the lithium and uh, mm -hmm. Elon debuted his truck and his uh, stock, you know, shot up. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. like, it's like you look at these symbols and these signs and these things that you pick up and put two and two together. And it's not some wild conjecture. It's stuff that's right there in front of your face. And so I, you know, I, 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 I would uh, I would show contempt to anyone who would call this like conspiratorial <laughs> thinking because it's we are just we are observers and 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 I and I love that you even spoke about how you know before you spoke out you you had to ask yourself if this was some sort of hubris or something on your end right mm -hmm. like, is this some sort of like why am I doing this why am I speaking up about this am I and I think part of the reason and you can correct me on this but I think part of the reason maybe why you wrote this article and why you put these things out in such a clear and concise way um, is a way of like honoring to yourself what you're and confirming what your Absolutely. eyes see and what your brain I, reads and the information yeah. that you take in and the consistency of the logic and the geopolitical meta narratives and all of this um, as you understand it as a sane, rational, you know, uh, human being that, that has a brain on their, on their shoulders, you know, 
You you look mm-hmm. at this stuff and you're like, this shit is just not right. This shit is contradicting. This shit is inconsistent. And and yeah. so I I'm just really really happy that you wrote this that I was able to take <laughs> it in and that I can share this with my audience and um and I think this episode will go really well with the episode before with Dr. Ostaber where he talked about the yes. uh, the population like statistics oh yeah yeah I mean mm-hmm. when I saw his thread when he started talking about the six uh you know problems with the with the Weider narrative I was like thank you for spelling this out I mean I think uh, because and and my intention in doing both of these episodes and and having you and Dr. Bear on right was because i I understand that the events uh, in atlanta that happened right the the Mm -hmm. six asian women who lost their lives that day um that is the logical end of these you know mechanisms of dehumanization that are yielded from the imperial projects and our presence Mm -hmm. in the asian pacific and the long an awful history of the hypersexualization of Asian women, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and the portrayals of Asian people in our media, the portrayals of Asian people in our cinema, like Sylvester Stallone. You're the fucking awful fucking like like I I some days I think about those Rambo movies and I'm like, is yeah, yeah, Sylvester yeah, yeah. Stallone like a is he just a fucking op? Is what that guy is because <laughs> because when it was time for us to have a movie about reliving the Vietnam War. He was there when it was time for us to um support the mujahideen right and and mm-hmm. against the russians there was rambo part three right what all during this time he's making the fucking rocky movies that like, you know posturing the big other of the russian oh, against so the you know what the rocky movies are fantastic and again right right i i <laughs> i i i think it's funny because i like my like i i actually don't like most of the modern entertainment, but I used to like old blockbusters. Like I still think Jurassic Park and stuff like that is very watchable. I right, kind of right. like that era of Hollywood. Me because too, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's both, I think all media is propaganda. Some people don't like that. Some people are like, oh, some art transcends. And I'm like, eh, I don't know, not really. If the art is transcending, it's probably because it's so in line with the uh, hegemonic cultural norms. You don't, don't notice how it produces it. But anyway, that's mm, besides mm, the point. Right. So, Rocky movies, I think they're fantastic in the sense that they capture how America likes to see itself, right? Like, America is simultaneously talking about how the USSR is like some some poor shithole or whatever. Right. Um, but in their movie, the USSR is this, like, ultra-muscular, like, Ivan Drago. Um, right, right. With, like, chemicals pumped into him and stuff like that. And America is like this grass-fed, like, scrappy <laughs> underdog Italian immigrant. You know what I mean? Right, right. I think it's really, really nice. Uh, to treat Ip Man, especially Ip Man 4, as propaganda, but treat it, like, treat it like Rocky. I'm not saying it's propaganda in a negative way. I'm saying it's just watch this movie to kind of get a sense of how maybe the Chinese see themselves or some Chinese see themselves just as some Americans see themselves as Rocky. And see what you, like, I think that's interesting because um, like, I, I really, actually really, really like Ip Man 4. I thought it was like surprisingly really, really, really amazing. Um, not that I didn't like the other ones, but that one was like a little bit more, more than I expected. Um, but yeah, I think when it comes to this counter propaganda stuff, um, conspiratorial stuff, I, like everyone else, I am always worried that I'm getting it wrong. Like why am I getting it wrong? I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to have put out misinformation out there that would get people hurt, but people tend to treat this problem as if the options are you speak out about your, your problems with the narrative and, and co- potentially cause danger, or you keep quiet and go along with the narrative and everything's fine. But keeping quiet and going on with the narrative is not actually a peaceful option. Like if you keep quiet and go along with the narrative, you know, you're responsible for the war or for the sanctions that murder people or whatever. So for me, it's not really a question of speak out and take a risk or not speak out and not take a risk. You're taking a risk either way. So, so if you care about these subjects, you really have no choice but to like develop an opinion about it one way or another. I think what what this what, what there's a lot out there is this. I am I am I am very I'm doing my duty towards human rights or whatever by repeating the mainstream narrative. Like I I've expressed my my pain for the plight of the Uyghurs, so I did my part. I'm like, that is that is not like even even if I end up being wrong. And again, if anyone is listening to this and they want to ask me questions, they find some errors in what I'm saying, they think I'm missing something glaring. Please reach out. Like I, I, if there's anything I'm getting wrong, 
I will correct it. I will retract it. I will, I will change stuff. But I don't think that staying quiet about these things is in any way an honorable or moral thing to do, which is what seems to be the prevailing thing. It's like, if you're speaking out against it, you are being edgy. If you're going alongside with it, even though you're agreeing with Mike Pompeo and Marco Rubio and all these people, that's fine. That's fine. You're like, worst case scenario, it'll turn out like the war in Iraq, but whatever. Nobody got punished for that one. So it's fine. You know? Yeah, man. You know, like, I think um, Max Blumenthal did some good work on this topic, too, but I was a little disappointed. Um, and I, you know, after the talk with uh, Dr. Bear, I kind of got clear on that and understood where that was coming from. But I, I you know, I'd ask, I had asked, uh, uh, Dr. Bear, like if he, because most of these guys, what Blumenthal did, he came to the conclusion, he was like, look, I have no doubts that there are human rights abuses happening in China right now. Um, mm -hmm. but is it a genocide? No. And I asked Dr. Bear, I'm like, Hey, you know, is this, uh, would you generally agree with that? And he was like, uh, no, that is a, too much adopting the terrain of Western propaganda. I agree. I agree with and, Dr. Bear there. And I, I no. agree with him too. And it, he kind of set me straight and, 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 and I got to looking at, kind of uh, Max Blumenthal after that and understanding that um, maybe these pressures of like not speaking out or if you do speak out, you'll get, uh, I don't know, like you'll get uh, some some desi undesirable results or, you know, yeah, <laughs> at yeah, that yeah. point, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, there yeah. are these uh, cultural conventional pressures to go along with the narrative. And so in order to perhaps be taken seriously maybe maybe max felt like he had to put that disclaimer out there like flashes like i'm actually anti-china credentials before he said hey but this isn't a genocide you know yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. so so yeah i i get what you're saying man and there's a whole lot of pressure on this right now there's a whole lot of propaganda surrounding this and there's a whole lot of different things as you mentioned and we we don't have to go over them again um yeah. but i just i want to thank you for writing this and for and and for listeners out there, when you read this article, he has something like 40 different uh, cited things. So you can click on where it shows you the National Endowment for Democracy claims to have funded the Uyghurs since 2004. You can click on the, um, you know, showing... Winston this. Churchill? Yeah, uh, the, the Winston Churchill thing, man. Like, you know, I, I looked at that and I realized that, I mean, not that I wasn't aware of like a long history of wanting to subjugate China, um, geopolitically speaking, right? But like, it was really interesting. That was a 1902 interview with, with Winston Churchill that... Uh, yep. You know, where he just he talked about the great uh, China split, how, you know, at some point we're going to have to split the Chinese or take the Chinese in hand or what have you and and split China. I mean, that's Winston Churchill talking about this stuff. So you could see how um, uh, this has always been on the radar of of the Western world. Um, and 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 I don't think that, like you said, they weren't counting on on the rise of Z. Uh, you know, uh, they, they weren't they weren't planning on the uh undermining of united states supremacy in the in world politics by the uh belt and road initiative set for completion in 2049 and we're seeing all sorts of leftist publications adopting the terrain of western propaganda like you mentioned the intercept uh novara media democracy now who platformed adrian zenz we're seeing mm -hmm. the washington post publishing shit like quote, in China every day is crystal knot or the New Yorkers inside the Xinjiang prison state. Fun fun fact, fun fact, but that guy yeah. who said in Xinjiang every day is crystal knot, yeah. that guy is like, was very pro uh, the, the war on terror, like the invasion of oh, Iraq. And yeah. he was actually, I think he wrote an article uh, where he was opposed to the United States pulling out of it and stuff like that. Like these people just say, things, you know what I mean? Like, I don't right, know. Right, right. It Doesn't really, it really bothers me that everyone's like, how dare you random online person with some Twitter followers, how dare you speak out against this topic? And yet other people can say whatever they want and there's no problem. Here's a thing that bothers me also. Uh, there's some sites, um, I like them. I don't know exactly what they're like. I like I like the general cut of their stuff. Uh, Chao Collective, they're a Chinese diaspora who write counter propaganda on the topic of China. Um, so a collection of academics like professors, assistant professors, et cetera, they wrote a letter um, kind of like denouncing them. They'd be like, this organization is, is like speaking out in favor of China. This is really bad, whatever. Uh, they should stop. Nobody should listen to them. Nobody should platform them. And I'm like, where is this letter for Adrian Zenz? Like, why are these professors, however socialist they may be or not be, whatever, why are they putting... Why is there more pressure 
on Chiao Collective than on Adrian Zenz. Like, he's your peer. His work should be peer-reviewed. If his work is not peer-reviewed, you should be speaking out against him. But there's no such... So again, this... I'm not saying these people are in cahoots or whatever. Um, Actually, can I read a... I'm going to read a small... I really think everyone should know this quote by Gore Vidal, sure, uh, sure. American oh, writer, yeah. 1986. I love Gore Vidal, yeah. The political science professors, perfectly sane men, look at me with wonder when I talk about the ruling class in America. They say, you're one of those conspiracy theorists. You think just headquarters and they get together at the Bohemian Grove and run the United States. Well, they do get together at the Bohemian Grove and do a lot of picking of secretaries of state anyway, but they don't have to conspire. They all think alike. It goes back to the way we were raised, the schools we went to. After all, I'm a reluctant member of this group. You don't have to give orders to the editor of the New York Times. He's in place because he will respond to a crisis in the way you want him to, as will the president, as will the head of the Chase Manhattan Bank. So I really like this quote because I don't, I I also don't like conspiracy theories. I don't like this, I mean, I I don't like this idea that there's like this little groups of people running things, like whatever. I, right, right. I think the system is much more. I think what I liked about Marxism, what really grabbed me about Marxism when I read Marx's Inferno by William Roberts, was this idea of Marxism analyzing how capitalism aligns everyone to be on the same page, elevates the right people to the right places in this organic way. It's not some like tiny group of people pulling strings. It's just a very like in our society, if you toe the line, you rise in business, in, in academia, wherever it is. Right. And when you end up with a society of, of, of um, what do you call them? Yes men, right? right yes right, men, right. yes right. women. So so when I look at the, I look at all these academics, again, they may actually be humanitarians, uh, socialists, whatever. But I, I, like, how? How is it possible they're writing a letter calling out Chow Collective, which is like an online diaspora group, and not one on Adrian Zenz? Like, make it make sense. Like, this... Adrian Zenz has already been thrown under the bus by most people. They all agree that his motivations are suspect. He's made technical errors. He 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 messes up with citations. He's essentially like uh, uh, I don't know what you call it. Like it's poor he's, scholarship. He's, yeah. yeah, it's very poor scholarship. How is it possible? And he's like associated with academic institutions and stuff. How is it possible that this guy receives more um, more attention, more more criticism, less criticism than than Chow Collective? Again, so until I feel like the discourse is healthier and more like makes more sense to me outside of this uh, careerist uh, paradigm, then yeah, that I it's 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 scary to put stuff out there involving such weighty topics such as genocide. But as I said in the beginning of the essay, like if the Financial Times is 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 being like hmm. Things are a little bit too, everyone's a little bit too on the same page on this China thing. It's kind of weird. There's no voices against. Well, yeah, like, I'll, I'll be it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I'll I be also, one of those voices against. Yeah, man. I, I, you know, you're so brave to do, man. And you and Dr. Bear, you know, actually just voicing these things. There's a reason why uh, people, more and more people are following you guys at this point. But, uh, but I also want to throw out there, you know, just to, to sort of put a capstone on all this, uh, to examine the accusation of being a genocide denialist, right? Um mm-hmm. First of all, there's a there's a big difference between like being say like a Holocaust denial or d- d- denier okay. and, and like and 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 questioning the accusations of of a genocide that's supposedly ongoing. Mm-hmm. You know, like like this thing is not set in stone. It's not in history books. It's not. Um, there's no national atonement for it. There's no discovery of mass graves. There's no anything that goes along with a genocide to to say yeah. that, like, that that when we are when and if anyone would cast accusations that we are genocide denialists, it's like that this is an ongoing thing that hasn't even like there's it's still a question very much so in the media, you know, like these are accusations. Well, that's you could call it you could call the terrorist lover if you if you if you were skeptical of episode mass destruction, you got called a terrorist lover. Right. You were right. called like a uh you were called like a denier, a terrorist lover, a terrorist supporter. Mm-hmm. I I the, the accusations just honestly just don't phase me. Like if if I turn out to be wrong about this, which I uh, as I said I sincerely doubt. But if I, I turn out to be wrong, I will live with myself knowing that I was doing the absolute best job that I could do at parsing through the information that was being sent my way. Like I just I feel like the people who are called uh, terrorism lovers or whatever in 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 the in the in the early stages of the war on terror, you know what like. They were vindicated, and maybe I'll be vindicated too. Um, and I did my part. Like I, I don't know what else to say. Like I understand people don't want to 
run the risk of saying something like being wrong about it. Like, I mean, like what is, there's also a risk for going along with it. Like, I, I don't know how to convey that to people. Like if, 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 let's just say hypothetically, uh, the United States sanctions people in Xinjiang, Xinjiang becomes an impoverished region, terrorism goes down, there's a war, millions of people die, more, more refugees, like, uh, and then it turns out that, like, people do an investigation, it turns out, oh, Adrian Zenz was wrong after all, who would have known, then I, I don't want to be a part of that. I, I don't, I was already kind of a little bit a part of that with the war on terror. Like, I went along with it. I, I believed a lot of the claims, and I, I feel bad about it. I feel right. people don't feel bad about it. They, they, it's, it's like, it's like, <laughs> right. it's like oh, I was, I was wrong about that one, but this one, this one I'm down for. And I'm like, come on, man. Like, don't you yeah, feel, like, yeah. I feel bad about having, I feel bad about having told even friends of mine in Peru telling them, oh, you're an idiot. Like, how can you not believe this? Whatever. Like, I feel bad that I took the wrong, the, the wrong side of that. Uh, the, the wrong side of that dispute. And I, that's why I corrected my course. If I have to correct it again in the future, that's fine. I'm also just a person posting online. Like, it's fine. Like, I, I, I'll, I'll, it's like, you know what I mean? Um, right, right. It's like, it's like there, there are worse things than being wrong, but it's not the end of the world if you're wrong. What's wrong is not honoring, uh, you know, the, the eyes that allow you to see things, the brain that allows you to create the logic exactly. to understand it. Like, if you see these things, you have to speak out because silence is complicity. And, and you know, mm -hmm. the, the part of the overall structure of this and what I'm hoping as a result from these episodes, like if you're if you're listening to this right now uh, and. And, and you're looking at this stuff and you maybe understand now you have a better window, a better vantage point, a better lens of which to view the insidious and pernicious way that the Western propaganda works, the pseudonyms, the infiltration of small independent uh, news outlets in order to further uh, propaganda and, and, and messaging, right? If you're enabled or enhanced uh, with a better lens by which to view and interpret this stuff from out of this, um, I think that maybe a key cog, a key thing to, 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 if we can dispense with this notion of like a, of the Chinese committing a genocide right now, there is a lot of other things that can crumble around that as well. Like if yeah. we can have people re-examine, fundamentally re-examine the narrative that's being uh, propagated by uh, the Washington Post and the New York Times and, and all these media sources in the United States about China that are positing them as a big enemy. If we can actually you know debunk this entire claim mm -hmm. about an ongoing genocide then perhaps we will also compel individuals to re-examine their uh how they feel about china in general about the whole uh you know the, the covid19 stuff about the wet market mm -hmm. you know about mm -hmm. about the the racial tropes um about the imperial mm -hmm. projects like hopefully mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. runoff from just from just tackling this one giant issue that is ongoing yeah. right now. And that's sincerely my hope out of all of this. And I, I, I think yeah. even, even just in studying your article, man, it's, it's, it's opened my eyes that much more to the way Western propaganda operates. Um, because again, I, I hadn't seen anyone lay it out this sort of plainly and be like, Hey, first things first, um, who's the guy that wrote this? Yeah, you know, first things first, it's like, who does this guy work for? Get a feel of the person who wrote this before you start taking their word as truth. Um, mm -hmm. So, but Roger, man, I really appreciate talking to you, man. I thank you for being here. Um, thank you for inviting me. This yeah, I want to have you back on the show at a certain point in the future once uh, once other, as they inevitably will, as other narratives pop up as your work continues. Um, I'll continue checking back on redsales.org for more of your writings as well. I would encourage listeners to do the same. We'll have links uh, in the show notes to these articles, um, including the the other article that you sent along as well for me to read, which is like a whole history about uh, communism and, and yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, and I actually, will close with that one. Yeah, when we were saying the goodbyes or whatever, I'll I'll, I'll pitch that one because I think it's important. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just that that we need to reclaim our history and understand uh, what socialism is moving forward. And um, and I didn't really understand why you asked me to read that in addition to to like doing this. But after reading the article and kind of going through this conversation, I I can see that there's a there's a there's a different there's a different arc in our conversation of like, hey, we 
you know, we need to acknowledge things that have happened within a material scientific basis and take the good things from there and move forward with the socialist project that enhances our future, that brings together class solidarity, that internationalizes mm-hmm. the proletariat in such a way that we can rise up and mm-hmm. uh, and, and and overthrow these, these fucking capitalist regimes, you know, and, and, yeah. and have decent, nice things in our life, you know, like healthcare. Uh, like, uh, so, so, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable to me. One of the things that's crazy about the, the whole rise of Xi Jinping is like, yeah. I can't can't believe that this guy kind of like made this slogan stick where it's like China is aiming for moderate prosperity. <laughs> like, <laughs> right, like right, I right. mean, I'm sorry, but like, okay, forget about anything else, you know, what you being China, whatever. Like, what a what a nice slogan by comparison to this kind of like the American. I, I think aiming for moderate prosperity is just a much more realistic, nice, equitable, everyone can kind of we can imagine everyone having moderate prosperity in a way we can't, we can't imagine everyone having the American dream. Right. Right. So I just think, again, we need to learn. We need to learn from other people. We need to learn not only from the past. A lot of people romanticize like, Oh, like let's look at what like the, our ancestors. No, no, no. We need to look outside right now, right now, right today and see what people are doing around the world that we can use to our advantage here. Right. So, so I think, uh, I guess, to close up, the reason I asked you to read that article by Domenico Lacerdo, Flight from History, um, is because I, I think he's a very important reader, uh, writer that everyone in the in the socialist West should read. Because Italy, in many ways, uh, he's an Italian uh, communist, and in many ways, Italy existed always at like the boundary between like the East and the West in Europe, in some ways. Or right. it's kind of it's both this, it's both goes back to like Greece, Rome, and all these things. But also, it had like a sta- like a f- very Stalin-friendly uh, communist movement during the second uh, the Cold War or whatever. So, Domenico Lucido, I think, is very, very good at criticizing the the Western communist movement. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not yeah. like it's not like criticizing Western society in general, which a lot of people are very are very good at that. He's very good at criticizing. Western socialism specifically, Western communism, not the people who are like saying Marx is bad, like anarchists, whatever. No, the people who are saying Marx is good, Lenin is good, things go sour afterwards. And Domenico Lucerto is very good at unpacking why we wear that like an albatross and the problems that it causes, in particular in our assessment of the late USSR, starting with Stalin, well, the, the mid late USSR starting with Stalin, and the Chinese project. Like people throw out like all the Chinese communists are, or every Chinese communist after Mao is a traitor, like nothing, like it's nothing. And I'm like, Domenico Lucido is very good at putting a stop to that and making you think, what do you know about these people? What have you read from them? Right. Who are you taking your judgments from? Um, so here wrote Flight from History, which I, again, instead of boosting my stuff, I want to boost Domenico Lucido's stuff. Uh, Flight from History is available on Red Tails. You can just read it there. And there's also Liberalism that Counter History. It's a book. You can just buy it. It should be available in most stores, I think. Um, but that's what I'd like for people to do. Come to Red Sales, uh, send me a message whenever you want. I'm happy. But read Domenico Lucido. That is my actual advice. <laughs>